we've constantly underestimated the resilience of this economy. But we are seeing some moderation. There is a long and variable lag to tightening of financial conditions into the real economy. We're seeing disinflation everywhere. We're really seeing deceleration and disinflation in the U.S. economy. We're seeing disinflation in the U.S. economy that is you know, gradually becoming more broad-based. I don't think it changes the move in July from the Fed. They can't take their foot off the pedal yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramo. Stocks up, yield to lower, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your bond market has a bid. Yields are aggressively lower. Last week on <clears> Thursday, 5.11% on a two-year this morning. 464, a big turnaround, TK, following CPI yesterday morning. I'm going to steal from Steve Engelder. I know, John, you've got a comment from the wonderful cross-rate strategist from uh, the Standard Charter Bank, Game Changer. It's Game Changer Thursday, follows on from what we saw yesterday. And what I don't see is a lot of analysis of how yesterday's drama links up with tomorrow's jobs report. Jobs report scenario A, B, C. How does the disinflation report fold into that? That's the topic for today. July done deal for a rate hike, most people assume it is, Tom. Going forward from there, what does September bring? What does Jackson Hole bring? We need a few more data points like we did yesterday, Lisa, to get this Federal Reserve to change its tune because listening to some of those Fed officials, that was just one data point for them. And likely they are going to continue with hawkish rhetoric, even if underneath they're feeling pretty good. Even if underneath they're thinking, OK, this is the last one and we can go. But we got to tell them that we're going to necessarily go because they want to get long end rates up just for that security that they can tighten financial conditions. Yeah, going from the data to earnings season, TK, PepsiCo just dropped it across deal. the screen. Full year organic revenue plus 10 percent. They had seen plus 8 percent. The estimate was plus 8 eight percent. So a lift to the outlook. This TK, is the heart of the matter. Heart of the matter is perfectly timed as we begin uh, what's going to be a really interesting Thursday. I'm going to go to Jackson Hole, the Pioneer Grill. We do our work. I go in and you have to have the chip beef on toast and the cowboys are in there like real cowboys are in there and they're drinking Pepsi for breakfast. With their, with their chip beef on toast, and that's how you get to 10% organic revenue growth. Pepsi dovetails really nicely into what we'll see today with PPI, the producer price index, coming out after <clears throat> CPI yesterday. It is likely going to come in lower than what the prices are that these companies can pay. Margins have been expanding slowly in a number of different companies because they have pricing power. How long can we see that? That, I think, is the silver lining that we well, keep seeing that maybe can narrow as we see headline CPI coming. You know, Lisa, you and I put up with this. John is, you guys don't know this. John is so healthy, folks. Every day, he can run the gauntlet in the food court and go buy the Cheez-Its without grabbing one. I have to. But John Frito-Lay, and I know you're not familiar with any of their products, their revenue is up 14 percent. I've never imagined that in 30 years. They do Quaker Oats, don't they? Over at PepsiCo. Isn't that their thing? I thought it was. I'm not sure about that. No? All I know is double that check on that. Tom single-handedly is boosting the profit margins. Is that what you're doing? Got that right. OK, yeah. good. Are we done with PepsiCo? I think we are. That's a big deal. Delta coming up a little bit later. The airline's up something It'll like 50 percent year to date. Delta, United, American. Look out for those numbers later this morning. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500. Positive, 0.3 percent, adding to the gains from yesterday. Adding to the losses in the FX market for the dollar. The euro pushing 112, 111.72. Positive, 0.4 percent, taking out the highs on that currency pair for the year so far. TK yields down dollar weaker. 11% appreciation the Bloomberg Dollar Index. And there's just a simple banner to put up on radio. I'll just talk it to you. USD MXN under 17 to a shocking 16.88. Again, on this game changer Thursday, John, I've never framed a sub 17 peso. Getting closer to 112 on the euro, <laughs> taking a look at EM and G10. Lisa, just to finish on the bond market, the 10-year at the moment, 381. It has been a shocking move, particularly in the two-year over the past couple of weeks. What we're looking at today, 8.30 a.m., U.S. producer price index as well as jobless claims. We are expecting the producer price index to come in to 2.6 percent from 2.8 percent the prior month. The key is how long can it remain below what we see in the prices that companies can pay? Basically, our input prices that much lower than the pricing power that these companies have. And we get a read of that from the companies themselves. We just got Pepsi earnings. We're going to get a call later this morning around 
8.15 a.m. Delta will come out around 6.30 a.m. and then has a 10 a.m. call. Very curious to see how long they can continue to pass along those price increases, particularly from Delta, after what we saw with airline prices going down 8.1 percent in yesterday's CPI uh, report. And as far as Fed speak goes, 6.45 p.m., Fed Governor Chris <coughs> Waller giving a speech on the economic outlook at a New York event. John, they're going to be hawkish. When do they start indicating that they're moving away from future rate hikes? Because right now, the messaging has to be consistent that they haven't done enough. And that was what it has been consistent throughout all the speak yesterday. Mike McKee's mentioned this a few times, but Governor Waller, this time last year, I believe, said that perhaps inflation could come down and unemployment could remain stable. He took a lot of criticism, Tom, from a lot of people in ivory towers in academia. And here we are. CPI coming down to about 3%, unemployment well, around 3.5%. I've got no idea what the future holds. All these guys Just are, an observation about where we are yeah, right now. All, all these guys are different, but Waller's hugely respected within the research community to synthesize those kind of data. And again, that dovetails with a disinflation Wednesday and how do you link in tomorrow's jobs report and what it means particularly for the bears in this equity market. Tony Dwyer with us around the table, Chief Market Strategist at Canaccord Genity. Tony, wonderful to see you. He hasn't so, uh, been here since Nixon was Three president. years. Yeah, I was good. wondering what happened to the Cheetos. And then I look over here They're upstairs, here at this aren't guy. they? Is he taking them all? <laughs> Did you stock up this morning? It's like the commercial <laughs> all over your way. <laughs> on the way out of the building, <laughs> Tony, on the way out of the building, he takes them and takes them home with him. Yeah, I do. Ten well, a day. Well, they're, they're free here. They're got, not at us. I, I, I've got an intern, Tanya from Northwestern. And Tanya, you look in her drawer, she's got a year's supply in there just to get her through it. Tony, wonderful to see you. You've so been cautious, conservative. Do you see reasons to be bullish now? So, and I'm still that way. You're seeing a broadening out, which is healthy. But I thought yesterday was an interesting day because it, you know, game changer. Listen, inflation should be going down. The economy is is slowing. We've seen that in the, in the forward-looking labor reports. The thing that's interesting is that the industrials and other cyclical areas underperform yesterday. The Dow Jones Industrials even was only up a quarter of a percent after it's a really index, huge start. Dow so Dow Jones Industrial Average. So, all right. So let's go. Let's talk about it. back when they had candles that were on set because we didn't have lights when you and I got into the business. <laughs> Right. Remember the, Dow, remember the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Every portfolio manager used it. That was the benchmark. Mm. But then it became so concentrated that the portfolio community made the S&P 500 the benchmark. It shifted in the late 1980s, early 1990s because of the concentration factor. And I think, I think that's probably true here as well. Well, just to build on what John was asking about, you have been defensive. Yesterday, a lot of people were saying it's a game changer. Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank came out and said it's very hard to find anything negative, any negative spin on what we have just seen, which is real disinflation across almost every input. What would it take for you to change your view and become more constructive. So, Lisa, our, our call has been to be light and tight. The time to be super negative from a market perspective. I'm negative from an economic perspective. But the time to be super negative from a market perspective was back last year early in the year as soon as Jerome Powell inv used the word Volcker. Because then you know who was going to intentionally invert the yield curve. When you've got so many companies that are already – they're still down 50 percent or 60 percent from their 52-week high. That's not the time to all of a sudden make a major downside bet. I, light and tight means extra cash and a little bit more of a defensive posture to take advantage of a recession-based weakness. And I still believe that we're trending toward a recession because of the labor mm. market. Um, the employment trends index has never gone to the current level without – going and being in a nearby right. recession. The same with, this. even yesterday, Small Business Hiring Plans Index. The optimism ticked up a little bit from a depressed level, but the hiring plans went down. So what would it take for me to change is really going to see the labor market inflect. In other words, you're, you're stopping, weakening from it. <clears throat> you're going to get this mystical soft landing despite a very, I, I believe that the Fed is already probably 100 basis points too tight. So the idea that we should have expected, you know, that we're going to keep going up in rates. Look at the disinflation in goods and, and non-durable goods. It's been extraordinary. How is that right. not going to happen for services if the labor market weakens? And that's what hits margins. People don't really – I'm kind of on a rant here. But no, I didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had too many cheers. So the, you know, the, the margins come down and compress on a macro level when revenues fail. They, they can come down a little bit when costs go up. But if you look back at profit margins historically for companies, for the S&P 500 and for households, it's when you 
when you lose your revenue stream, you cannot cut your costs as fast right. as you drop the revenue. You're an acclaimed optimist on the street. You've been cautious recently. I get that. I want you to walk through the process of how bears rationalize walking away from a bear call to some form of optimism and a bull. What's the process? Is it sector by sector? How do you move from being a bear to being, OMG, I gotta be in the market? So on, on June 7th, we had put out a, there's finally some hustle in the Russell. It, it's a broadening of the market. It, it's when you go from the mega cap tech stocks, the eight stock, remember the eight top eight stocks in earlier in, in late May represented 117% of the gain year to date. That's broadened out. Now it's about 70% and you're seeing it. Um, but again, I think it has to be associated. That's, that's associated with a soft landing scenario that you, there's so many indicators that don't prove that out that what's really going to change them is ultimately you start to reaccelerate earnings or you go into a recession. Earnings tomorrow morning. JP Morgan, Wow City. What are you focused on, Tony? Well, when I talk to the credit folks, um, the only areas that are really doing pretty well are the private credit. And what I might have gotten wrong, um, to a and early is wrong, um, I've been too defensive. What I, what I didn't see as much as probably is happening is the impact of private credit. When you invert the yield curve, it stops banks lending. So I don't think we're going to hear anything tomorrow uh, or going forward that all of a sudden the economy is really booming now and that um, banks are lending. The credit people I talk to, that's not accurate. What is happening is companies like Apollo and other names like that in the private credit market, PacWest, they sell $2 billion worth of bonds. If you sent that into the market, uh, you know, give me a bid, not good. But Apollo-led conglomerate just takes it all down on one trade. So there is something different in the credit market that may be buffering what would normally happen if you have a, a, a free open market trading in public securities on it. Tony, this was awesome. I can't believe it's been three years, I which is just I, ridiculous. I, I got to say, I, lo I love the show. You guys have you. a great vibe and it's say. terrific. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> I'm going to go up to the food court for a little bit. <laughs> that's, well, that's, all this, that's all this praise is about, <laughs> yeah. the free food upstairs. That's all, well, it took me three years to want it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Dwyer there, a canical generative, going into the data a little bit later this morning, PPI, then onto the earnings tomorrow morning, yeah. City, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, onto next week, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Tom, and Goldman. Did you see my brain freeze there at the beginning of the show? I was up all night dealing with Seth Melanger and this great uh, Red Sox thing we're doing, and I thought Jobs Day was tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about tomorrow as in, like, next month's jobs report. I, just, <laughs> I didn't, I, like... I, I just tried thought, to tune it out. Like, I like, the news tomorrow. Yeah, like, no, tomorrow's yeah, yeah. news. No, like, I, yeah, I, payrolls I, last week was yesterday. I was waiting for news. you to gracefully no, I, to yeah, put no, in there. No, at least like, you should you know, have just... That's what, I was, that's giving, what him the, I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. I, I <laughs> thought he meant, like, tomorrow's payrolls report was next month. That's normally what you would do is you would say, like, yeah, we'll find out the hiring plans of the companies that are going to report earnings tomorrow. They're usually trying to smooth over the cracks, like, sure, but... I, Lisa, I didn't realize that was an Lisa, accident. You should have just waited. Hey, stupid. It's not Jobs Day tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Well, you know it's not Jobs Day now. I it's got bank that. earnings tomorrow. But, but okay. bank earnings, Good I can fold into the disinflationary story, too. We'll make okay. that script work Good as save. Well. Good Thank save. You. How did the episode go on the Red Sox? I'm humbled by the people I worked with, folks. This is, you know, forget about, you know, me and all that. This is about the Red Sox, the Penguins, and John, a lot on Liverpool. Much more on English football than I thought that Seth would do. But this is just this great team of people he had who said, oh, my God, he really sucks at this. we got to try to make this better. And I, I'm humbled. I, I'm really um, – we just heard from the Red Sox actually moments ago. They're happy? And, no, I'm not sure they're happy. Okay. Well, that's I'm, often a good thing. I said to Julie, I said – You, you know, want to upset the subject just a little bit. I said to you Julie know. on Twitter yesterday, I said, Julie, look, pick up Otani from the Los Angeles Angels and make this good. You have a plaque. Just upset the subject a little bit. Just a little bit. You know, don't offend them so much they won't come back, but just – a little bit. You know, you know, it can never be too did happy. Did Dwyer do okay? Ever. I thought Dwyer was... If the PR's too happy, you've done something wrong. That's always been my, my take. Maybe that's the wrong take. Equities right now, positive. A third of 1%. Today, that inflation has been cut by two thirds. So, my message is take yes for an answer, Chair Powell, and let's stop with the rate increases. Done. Done. Senator Warren of Massachusetts catching up with the team yesterday afternoon. 
on Bloomberg Politics, Banners of Power. Very good programme. You should tune in later on in the afternoon, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Senator Warren weighing in on the Federal Reserve. Guess what? Apparently they're not done. Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zetner, they're going to hike. That data yesterday won't stop them hiking in July. Mike Gapen, recent data keeps us confidence. The Fed will raise rates by 25 basis points in July. Andrew Hohenhorst saying the same thing. Maybe it changes the game for September. Andrew Hohenhorst, the city, has been saying for a while he thinks they go in July and again in September. This is what he had to say just yesterday. A July hike is still very likely. Softer CPI does raise the bar for a September hike, which could instead be pushed to November. Oh, come on. So that's the latest call right now, TK, on Wall Street. Hey, Lisa, you're better at this than I am. You know, you know, somebody said, what was the thing we had hawkish, what, was, what did we say like 10 hawkish days pause. ago? Hawkish pause. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? I, I mean, we're just staggering. Well, well to be fair, they are going to hike yeah. potentially yeah, again this month. Yeah, but we're staggering around on the data. The data yesterday was jaw-dropping. Forget about all the phrases and the dots. I like, John, what you said. The center tendency dot I'll give you. The dispersion of the dots is just a parlor game. I take your point about the data, and this is the reason why a lot of people are saying by November, the data will have changed enough that they won't have the ammunition to hike, which is the reason why so many people think that the last one will be the one that we get on July 26th. I, I don't know what to say. I'm looking at futures out there. They're beginning to test a 4,600 level. Some good news yeah. for you. Oxford Economics, Tom, they agree with you. The tightness cycle likely coming I, to an end. Yesterday, again, to Steve Englander, there was a game changer. There's also game changes in politics right now. We're going to stagger over to the July zeitgeist that's out there. Joining us, Vice Presidential Candidate Terry Haynes. He's founder of Pangea <laughs> Policy. Uh, Terry, Greg Vallier is causing trouble this morning, and he's bringing up what's always brought up, which is a third party. I wrote back to Greg. I said the Mansion Haynes ticket looks awfully good, but it would also be third party pain. Are we really going to have a Ross Perot 2024 or John Anderson, a third party, to get in the way? Uh, that's the current Washington parlor game. You're quite right, Tom. But uh, I think the chances of that are very, very slim indeed, and particularly in making any sort of a dent. People uh, <clears throat> always forget, uh, even if they remember Ross Perot and his 92 run, that uh, you know, Perot got something like 19% uh, of the popular vote, but didn't get a single electoral college vote, which is where the rubber meets the road on this stuff. Uh, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction with the two political parties, but at the same time, I think that said dissatisfaction is, is very much overstated. It said a lot that, oh, there's 40% of independents <clears throat> and all the rest. You dig deeper and ask yeah. those independents which uh, which party they'd probably end up with or candidate. Uh, it's like 80, 80 to 90% the place where they came from. So, uh, and, you know, there you, you can already see the beginnings of uh, both political parties trying to light no labels on fire. So I think, right. uh, I think. So that's very definitely no. And Terry Haynes, I, I, I look at the bipartisan understanding that presidents love to go to foreign events, get a photo shoot, shake some hands, and then they have to come home. Who does President Biden want to have a photo shoot with when he gets back to the White House? What's topic one for the president after NATO glory? Well, I think probably uh, in the in the photo op category, probably Ambassador Markarova of uh, Ukraine to the United States. Uh, after that, probably the EU ambassador and a few other folks uh, from the European Union. Uh, you know, the the storyline here this week is, you know, Biden's having a really good week between the inflation numbers and the NATO result. Uh, but I think that the real story uh, in NATO, frankly, is Europe getting much more serious about common defense after all these years. You'll recall going back to the previous administration, uh, Europe uh, greeted with some uh, many constituent nations in the European Union greeted with some horror the idea that they were going to be actually asked to uh, make good on their promises of 2% to GDP spent on defense. And, uh, you know, that we're way over the hump on that now. So, uh, you know, so Europe's rise as a more serious entity for its common defense, I think, was the big story there this week. You know, there was other reviews. There were other reviews that came out, including this one former ambassador to Germany, John, uh, John Kornblum in The New York mm -hmm. Times, who wrote about the communique from NATO that it screams fear and insecurity from every word. Ukraine's future is with NATO fine, but please don't ask when or how NATO entry will happen. Just make some unidentified reforms and we shall see. Do you disagree? Did you see unity and cohesion around the message, even if clouded in a lot of uncertainty? 
Well, I think, yeah, I think I did. Uh, you know, they're all trying to shuffle together, right? Uh, and uh, and pay attention. I mean, this is not a. It's wrong to think of this as a United States-led coalition. Uh, this is a group that you know that needs uh, to understand where they are in, in specifics and needs uh, commonality of purpose. And uh, they they find it difficult to get there a lot of times, but they are getting there. And uh, yeah, I think there was some uh, uh, some mess and some cleanup uh, needed, but I, but fundamentally, I think that was around the edges. I mean, I think what you got out of this was. Uh, uh, was a uh, a pretty good statement of purpose and a pretty good statement of where they are going forward. I mean, you know, ask China and its client state Russia how they feel this morning. They're already uh, huddling at uh, uh, the ASEAN meetings uh, trying to figure that out this week. Just quickly, in Congress, you are seeing discussion around some additional defense spending and possible social provisions put around said defense spending by a number of Republicans. Are you expecting this to be held up? Are you expecting this to become a real problem in Washington? Uh, defense spending? No, I don't think so. The, uh, you know, my view on the uh, on the debt ceiling budget deal, the, the day starting the day after, was it really wasn't a budget deal in the, in the sense of it being very binding at all. And what you were certainly going to get was increased defense spending. It's just a matter of how and when. Uh, frankly, Washington will take the next six months to find to finalize that. And absent any. Uh, any emergency needs on the Ukrainian side in particular, I think what you end up with is uh, is a pretty orderly process on defense, just the way it always is. Terry, I want to finish with the latest news in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and it's concerning for this administration. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, among U.S. Sure. officials whose emails were breached, hacked, Microsoft saying that hack originated from China, this reporting according to a uh -huh. person familiar with the matter. What's your response to that this morning, Terry, after we've seen Blinken go to China and Yellen go to China? Well, yeah, uh, spycraft as statecraft, I think. Uh, we're not going to stop spying on the Chinese or, you know, for for, for that matter, uh, many of our allies. Uh, China's certainly not going to uh, stop with us. Cyber warfare is a, uh, is a battlefield, uh, and it will continue to be so. Uh, you know, what I've always thought is that <clears throat> Our structures, uh, our infrastructure, whether it be uh, the you know in the e world or in uh, pipes and phone lines and the like, uh, you know we've spent a uh, we've spent what amounts to a generation uh, pretending those issues and problems aren't there, and we better hustle to actually bring our systems up to snuff. And that's certainly not the case in the federal government, but they really need to be working on that. Terry, thank you, sir. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. Just a little bit more colour on that story. Officials say the breach was relatively limited in scope, not just the United States, but reportedly, Tom, agencies in Western Europe also affected. It's a whole new world. I mean, it's all there is to it. And, and I, I just, I, I, I would like to believe, like a lot of people, John, that we have an entire infrastructure we don't know about that's doing something about this. But that's how you get in trouble. I mean, as Terry commented there, what's the initiative yeah. to maybe take the hyper secret and make it a little more visible? The latest news this morning out of Washington. Coming up shortly, Adam Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. Take a look at what's developing in the FX market. The dollar, a whole lot weaker off the back of yields, which are a whole lot lower in the last 24 hours. The euro against the dollar, taking out highs for the year, 111.61 on the screen right now. A new high for the session, 111.74 just moments ago. And I'm Ruskin at Deutsche Bank on why that can continue next. Three-day winning streak on the S&P 500 could become four. Equity futures right now on the S&P positive by 0.3%. Best day of gains of the month so far in yesterday's session. Following disinflation, inflationary data showing some cooling. The Nasdaq up again this morning by 0.7%. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. What a ride we've seen on the two-year. Two-year last week, this time last week, following the ADP report, blowout report, 
There we go again. Here we go again. Rate hikes, rate hikes, rate hikes, rate hikes. Yields up through 5.1% on a two-year. And then all of a sudden, back down to 465 on a two-year this morning. The 10-year right now, Tom, about 382. Quickly here, what do we hear from Fed speakers? I mean, what, what do they say now? Well, so where, Barkin, still go? Barkin said this yesterday. If you back off too soon... Inflation comes back strong, Correct. which then requires the Fed to do even more. Correct. Our target is 2%. I think you're going to hear more of that for the time being. Just one report, but really encouraging. Let's see if we get more of it. Just want to finish on the FX market, then I've got some earnings for you. In the FX market right now, the euro near highs of the session, near highs of the year, 111.64. We're positive there by 0.3%. And here we go again on raising the outlook. Delta, seeing full year adjusted EPS at $6 to $7. That's the current range for the outlook. They had seen the high end of five to six. So an upgrade there to the outlook, Bramo. Doubter in the pre-market, up 3%. Just to give you a sense, new record for industry passenger volume in the month of June. We saw that with records being hit for consumer uh, non-work business uh, travel that we saw over the past couple of weeks. Also saying that they expect their non-fuel unit costs to decline 1% to 3% year over year. Again, this speaks to lower in uh, input prices as they charge more to consumers. Very curious at the 10 a.m. call that we, what we hear about going forward forward the pricing power, especially after yesterday's CPI report, where supposedly airplane tickets dropped 8.1 percent. Sure. All of us were incredibly skeptical, especially given some of these profit margins that I'd they're expecting. I'd love to know how they measured that. Exactly. I think we all would. Yes. Delta year to date up more than 40 percent, close to 50 percent higher. Tom, American Airlines year to date, the same amount, basically. United Airlines, oh. pretty much the same amount. It's been quite a rally for those names. Well, it begins an exciting earnings season. We'll really dive into this tomorrow. Lisa's really excited about it. It's the wall of earnings we're going to see and to interpret it in real time uh, as we can. John? Some calls out there on the euro. I want to get to this from Adam Ruskin at Deutsche Bank with a call on the euro against the US dollar and writes in the following. The Fed's leadership in the global rate cycle will increasingly play against the dollar. As central banks pivot from rate hiking to rate cutting, we expect the euro against the dollar to end the year at 115 by the end of 2023, then extend the trend to the mid 120s in 2024. Tom, you'll love this. They go out to 25 before flattening out in 2025 as U.S. growth recovers. My experience is people listen when Alan Ruskin speaks. He has the privilege of working with David Fulkert's Landau and putting together holistic global research for at Deutsche Bank, their chief international strategist, joins us on what I'm calling from Steve Englander Game Changer Thursday. How much did the game change yesterday, Alan Ruskin, with disinflation codified in the United States? I don't know whether disinflation was codified, but things did certainly change substantially in the FX market. We've been entrenched in this incredibly narrow range, really, for most of this year, euro dollar in particular uh, was seemingly capped at 110.90. And I think once we broke that level, it's opened the floodgates in a way, and the dollar is on the defensive pretty much against all currencies. So uh, it's it's uh, codified a change, as it were, in the FX market, Tom. I looked at a very fancy regression of the blended DXY index back 20 years, and certainly off the great financial event of 2008, I can look for further 8% dollar weakness. Do you see that kind of scale to go further with dollar weakness? Tom, I do. Uh, you know, when you look at these big dollar cycles, you know, historically we used to have, you know, sort of six or seven years of up dollar uptick and then nine, you know, maybe even 10 years of dollar famine, as it were. Um, this last cycle got broken up a little bit because of COVID in particular. And we had a bit of a longer uh, uptick, but the down ticks, the down cycles are typically in the order of about 25% down on the trade weighted index. So we've probably gone maybe a quarter of the way through a typical down cycle. So even if we have, you know, a half a cycle, um, we could certainly get that 8% that you suggest, and it could be substantially more than that. When does fundamental growth matter again, Alan? I mean, we're talking about the rate hiking cycle. We're talking about inflation. But it also is a question of fundamental economic strength that the U.S. seems to be displaying, even as Europe faces a lot of headwinds and potentially more rate hikes into weakness. Yeah, you know, the way I look at it, Lisa, is that uh, there's a continuum where you think in terms of uh, strong growth, 
a sort of no landing situation. Uh, then a soft landing story uh, where you could even have a recession, but it's a shallow recession. Or you could have, you know, really amounts to, say, you know, a hard landing where the Fed pushes to the point where something really breaks. At the moment, in that continuum, you've shifted towards more of that sort of soft landing arena with the Fed pivoting in 2024. Uh, and that's the worst scenario as far as the dollar is concerned, because risk trades OK, and bonds in general like it, equities like it, but the dollar really doesn't like that, that, that scenario. So the dollar tends to do poorly against G10 because of the Fed pivot, and it doesn't do well against EM because risk usually is trading okay as well. And to that point, Alan, I'm thinking about typical cycles when the dollar does worse. Usually that is a risk on scenario, risk on in emerging markets, risk on around the world, a sense of growth. How does that dovetail into the potential weakness and greater weakness in other non-U.S. areas at a time when the U.S. is actually shockingly resilient and showing a much faster pace of disinflation? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we're certainly looking at the U.S. being one of the slowest uh, major economies in terms of GDP growth for 2024. Uh, the U.K. will probably outdo us on a you know GDP Q4 Q4 basis for 2024, uh, but the, the U.S. is you know pretty much up there. So we're not seeing and not do not expect that other economies will quite match the degree of slowing that we anticipate uh, for the first half of 2024. Obviously, if that you know, doesn't materialize, that gives the dollar a little bit more of a boost because you're not going to get the rate cuts that uh, we're expecting for 2024. Alan, where's a tradable pair here? I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, euro higher, but where's the opportunity here, the big figure trade that you would suggest for Deutsche Bank clients? Yeah, you know, I think if you want, uh, you know, sort of a souped up euro trade, then, uh, I, you know, I like uh, the Norwegian Kron particularly. I think uh, it's grossly undervalued by every metric that we look at, PPP, DBIR, FIR, I can, you know, throw out acronyms galore, and they all tell you the same story, that the Norwegian krona is grossly undervalued. So, you know, in a world where, uh, you know, sort of high beaters are trading okay, the Norwegian krona has got a long way to go still. I mean, you got Norway there. Is that an oil play where it's just simply a, a linked into a Deutsche Bank recovery in the price of oil, given better times given better global demand no i think it's a it's more of a high beta uh, euro trade really um it's got drawn down and pulled down a little bit by the swedish krona which is uh, you know had its own set of problems that don't necessarily relate closely to norway but uh, you know it's getting tagged along right. but uh, no i you know i see this really as uh, a euro play, but with a high beta currency that's uh, ex extremely undervalued. Alan, I featured at the top today the absolute shock of a peso comfortable 2120. And imagine Mexican peso strengthening through 17. I didn't frame that. How, how can that happen? How does Mexico improve from here to 15 or a 14 level? Yeah, you know, I think people have been playing the Mexico trade now for a couple of years and you just saw a little bit of a squeeze because, you know, a lot of people were long Mexico versus the yen and the yen side of things squeezed quite badly. Um, look, I think the Mexican fundamentals have been remarkably resilient for, you know, a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's underbanked as such and there's very little leverage in the system so that when rates go up, uh, the Mexican economy does prove pretty resilient. And then I think there's a structural story and a structural play, uh, you know, whereby people are relocating, you know, closer shoring, as it were, to the U.S. and away from Asia and, and China in particular. So I think those elements are still there. The data still looks OK. When the trade accounts start to deteriorate, we know and we'll get the you know, much stronger signal that uh, the Mexican peso is, is more significantly uh, overvalued. At the moment, it looks overvalued on a real exchange rate basis, but we don't really see it in the trade data. We're speaking with Alan Ruskin of Deutsche Bank at a time when the dollar is the strongest going back more than a year. You could see the euro ascendant. The possibility, as Alan projects out, of a 120 euro. Good luck to all of those European vacations that everyone's trying to clock in right now. I'm wondering, Alan, from your perspective, how much of a boost this will give U.S. businesses, international businesses that have suffered with a strong dollar in terms of uh, their sales overseas. Does this in some ways give a headwind to U.S. growth down the line in a sort of on the margins level? 
Yeah, I think, uh, Lisa, you hit the you used the right word. At the margins, this is going to be helpful uh, for U.S. corporations, uh, helpful for exports, helpful for the uh, uh, the equity market as well. So you know, you've got some constructive elements there. Uh, exports have held up quite well in the grand scheme of things uh, in the U.S. relative to other countries. Uh, so you know, this is going to be a, a further boost. I think there's some very helpful things happening in U.S. manufacturing. Uh, the defense industry is obviously doing extremely well. You've had this relocation in terms of semiconductor plants, uh, you know, back to the U.S. Uh, you know, you've got some very helpful elements there. So uh, I think this is, you know, this is, this is all the more good news as far as the resilience that you were speaking about earlier. Six days of dollar weakness against the euro. Euro dollar 111, 67. Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank there on the FX market. Let's turn to the equity market just briefly. Equity futures with a lift on the S&P 500. Likewise on the NASDAQ. <clears throat> we need to look at two names reporting earnings this morning. Beat and a raise over a doubter. Beating earnings expectations, raising full-year guidance. Ed Bastian speaking to Bloomberg saying this, there is significant growth ahead. Flying, Tom, the number one priority for discretionary spending. That stock in the pre-market up by 3%. I wonder what it ha- where we are in 12 months. And, and I say this, John, because to me, it's almost this, this economic babble. We talk about a jump condition. I go back to the images this weekend of an Acropolis in Athens absolutely overwhelmed with tourists. And my re- anecdotal from my family is it's happening everywhere. How is that happening and I guess from the airline standpoint, how can they sustain that? There's just is it is it a post-pandemic once-off, or is it something beyond that? Well, Tom, to that point, there's a range of theories, a range of data yeah. points, and you get to decide how much weight you put on each. What we did with goods was bring all that demand forward in the pandemic. What we did with services was push it all out, and we're experiencing that over the last couple of years. If you take the Neil Dutter view of the world over at Renaissance Macro, real income's positive, better, inflation down, well, wage growth great. <clears throat> That's one thing. Or you can look at things right now and say, look at the savings power coming out of the I, pandemic. It's dwindling and things might get harder later this year. I brought this up on Twitter overnight. You just absolutely nailed it. And this is from Justin Wolfers, the wonderful economist from the University of Michigan. And somewhere, you know, he should go to the White House just to bring some Australian levity. Uh, into the White House. And Walt Wolfers is outstanding. He's like a serious man. You think we need some Aussies? Yeah, we need some Aussies okay. in the White House. And, you know, we can't Hot get take. them in the Fed, so Wolfers can go to the White House and help Brainerd. And the answer is Justin Wolfers had the chart you just described. And guess what? The real wage line crosses the inflation line. Fact. There is another story that we have to point to when we take a look at the airlines. They said that spending on jet fuel dropped 24 percent on lower prices per gallon. When you talk about how much lower their expenses are, well, there you go. There are other expenses also that they're coming in as they strip out all of the luxuries or even any kind of amenities whatsoever that you're used to experiencing on those planes. I'm just saying editorializing. Um, But my, my point is here that they're facing these declines that might be one-offs, right? How much is the entire conversation influenced by lower oil prices in a way that have been, has been pretty dramatic and unexpected? For the consumer as well. Exactly. Not just for the airline. Nice of the airline to pass those cost savings on to the passenger. A right? little bit of them. Yeah, sure. One percent, maybe. Sure. Really <clears throat> feeling good. Is yeah. that what CPI captured That's, yesterday? Yeah, exactly. I still don't understand what that was about. You have your, in, your real-life experience, personal experience, with the world really tell me about and it. airlines. Let's talk about your personal experience. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> and then you have the CPI day to tell you that airline fares are down. And you're like, ah, eh, are they? Yeah, well, and maybe they're down, but then you get no peanuts. You get no chips. No chips. No, no drinks. No drinks. Chips. You gotta pay for Grandma's your life. upset with Delta. Let Ed know. <laughs> we still have a lot of problems. We have too much concentration in the banking industry. We have more too big to fail banks than we did back when the economy crashed in 2008. And the too big to fail banks are bigger than they were back then. So, you know, we're not out of the woods yet, but I feel a lot better when I read Michael Barr talking about how we need to tighten down on bank regulation. Go, Michael. Senator Warren never said that about quails, did she? A very different tone. Senator Warren there of Massachusetts. <clears throat> Do you think in another 15 years, this is all Senator Warren will be talking about 2008? Another 20 years? I, I, 25 years? Oh, 30 nice. years? 35 yeah. years? I take immense issue with her critics who treat her 
with a certain level of buffoonery. She is world class in bankruptcy law. This is a legit professor. Not okay. Maybe it's not bank regulation or bank supervision, but there's at least an adjacency to it. How many other politicians can we say that about? But Tom, I would agree with you. Yeah. But plays politics with every single financial issue that comes to the surface. In, every in, in single a certain one. Liberal Massachusetts way. There's just a certain Charles River way that you. Now I'm not here to defend too big <clears throat> to fail and massive banks and financial institutions. What do you think would have happened in March? If every bank was the size of SVB, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I think as people well know, I'm completely the other way. I mean, I, I adore the Canadian model. I Rand- think the Canadians do it right. Randy Quarles kind of responded yesterday. He came out and he was talking about how if Michael Barr goes through with this, it will be very harmful and unnecessary. So pushing back against the idea of raising more capital. I take your point. Elizabeth Warren, highly qualified, but mm. she also kind of puts herself out there by saying, "Just stop." Just make it stop, you know. And there, it's you know, obviously an incredibly complicated uh, discussion about what to do with rates, and she knows that as well as anybody else because she is a highly yeah. educated professional. It's, it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see. Yeah, do you all want to say that again, just to make sure you've got it across, you know, with the I, utmost I, respect? You know, well, I, utmost I do respect. have the utmost respect. I'm not kidding. Do you think the rant about the rate cycle over the last 12 months has been helpful? <laughs> yeah, sure. Very educated, though. That's good to know. John, I'm going to pick guys. out one data point here on the screen. It's the real yield coming in from 1.80 to 1.54. That's a clear indicator of the disinflationary tendency. Nominal yields, Tom, in a big move. We're down 10 yeah. basis points. Two year, 464. Yeah. We were through 5.1% only a week ago. We need to get you to Friday, where I thought it was a jobs report, and John corrected me gently and said, hey, stupid, it's about banks. In charge of banks, Erica Najarian uh, joins us now, large cap banks and consumer finance uh, expert here at UBS. Erica, just a general question to begin the discussion. What will you look for in the beginning of the press lease, press releases tomorrow into Monday into Tuesday? What is the theme, the tendency you will look for? So there are really three things that I'm going to look for. First is capital. Like it or not, uh, a lot of investors are laser focused on capital and how in, uh, how banks are building capital, not just because the rules are getting tougher, but also because there continues to be uncertainty in the economy in terms of the outlook, no matter what the macro prints are saying. You know, the second thing I'm going to look at is net interest income and how deposit costs and deposit growth are trending. Although a lot of investors are thinking that we are in the late innings of that being a catalyst, a negative catalyst for the stocks. And the third thing I'm going to look for is any signs that credit is deteriorating underneath the surface. As you know, as all three of you know, the market is very sensitive for, you know, any hiccups in commercial real estate. And so those are really the top three things I'm going to look for. In Friday. How do you weight your large cap world with the super regionals, the regionals and the SVB, like the, the smaller banks that are out there? What's the level of importance of the next three or four days versus everything else in bank earnings season? Well, I'll, I'll say that it's probably an even more pivotal time for the regional banks, particularly the super regional banks that are within the scope of the bar speech with regards to new regulation. So I think that JP Morgan, B of A, Wells, Citigroup, Morgan, Goldman, you know, those are institutions that have gone through the first iteration of the rule change when we went through, you know, Basel, the Basel III framework and put on these new capital rules and new liquidity rules sort of post 2008. So we have clear evidence that they've been able to survive and thrive under that regime. I think the super regionals are in a different spot where regulatory uh, rules are getting much stricter for them. And so they sort of have to balance and tell their investors how they're going to deal with that. Uh, Are they going to continue lending? Are they going to pause buyback for longer? How are they going to grow capital? The good news is that the bar speech is indicating that these super regional banks do have a lot of time before these tighter capital rules become final. There is a question, of course, also around some of the largest banks. Goldman Sachs, in particular, has been guiding down its guidance pretty aggressively and with a break from some of its past practices in terms of not giving intra-earnings uh, intra guidance. 
This is likely to become the worst quarter since David Solomon became the CEO. This according to Mike Mayo over at Wells Fargo. What are you expecting and why the negative kind of results that we're expecting? So, Lisa, not to defer your question, I actually don't cover Goldman Sachs, but given the vagaries of, you know, trading volatility, investment banking volatility in the quarter, um, you know, a lot of the banks have been, you know, giving mid-quarter updates, but also saying that a lot can change over the, you know, over the next few weeks. Going forward, what is going to be the main pressure that you're looking for? Is it going to be loan losses, loan loss reserves at the big banks? Is it going to be interest margins? Is it going to be how much the uh, deposit beta is increasing as they try to compete for deposits? That's a great question. I think that because the bank failures put deposit costs and deposit growth in the spotlight, it feels like that is already priced into the stocks in terms of further pain. And I think the CPI print gives bank stocks some relief as we can see the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel in terms of Fed tightening. <clears throat> you know, I think the one thing, and the bar speech was pretty much down to fairway, so to speak, with regards to what the market ex is expecting for further regulatory tightening. I think the biggest, biggest hurdle for investors in terms of you know, <clears throat> buying stocks, buying bank stocks here, despite the valuation, is that specter of credit. And so yeah. I think that's really the one thing that everybody's looking back, looking over their shoulder and saying, is it really time to buy bank stocks? Because I don't know what's going to happen in the economy. And maybe the last thing I really want to do is own bank stocks into a downturn. Uh, Erica, very quickly, we're out of time, but what's the single best buy right now? We're going into earnings season. We're going to tape this, play it back on Thursday. What's the single best buy among the big banks? Bank of America. I thought, oh, okay, that was short and brief. Thank you. We'll have to have <laughs> well, you did ask to... for a single best buy. You know, yeah, a single you... best buy, Bank of America. Now, Erica assumes we're up against the clock, Tom. Yeah. You know, that's know. the right thing to do. Okay. Erica and follow instructions, Tom. UBS. <laughs> Erica, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Erica. <laughs> Be of ATK. Well, it's a, it morning, like, you know, one of the great moments of, I, I think, in the last year, the last time, John, we were in Davos, which I think was six months ago, and a basic idea, we talked to Brian uh, Moynihan, and you and I decided we weren't going to ask him what the Fed would do. <laughs> we actually talked to Brian Moynihan, folks, I'm sorry to say, like we would talk to James Diamond. Good morning, uh, Joe. And, you know, I talked to them about banking, and Moynihan was encyclopedic on operations, and that's what you want to see. I feel like we do this every quarter. Just for the record, I'm pretty sure I've asked Brian about Fed policy <laughs> once or <laughs> twice. I will say this, though. What he's great at and what I think he is brilliant at, and I've said this a million times, he's one of those CEOs at a bank which seems to trust and have faith in his research department. Yeah. So when he is asked about those things, he knows what his research department thinks about them and will go out there and say, what Mike Gapin is thinking about Fed policy, what the team is thinking about the economy. If he's asked about markets, he can lean on some of the research from Savita Subramaniam. You know, that kind of makes sense as a leader of a financial institution. And I have a lot of respect uh, for Brian for doing so. I think it's, it's true. And of course, with the case there, and this is Erica's uh, uh, buy, not our surveillance buy, but the idea here of Moynihan picking up the pieces out of the great financial crisis from Ken Lewis. And, you know, I, I was mentioning this to somebody the other day, and I realized the person I was talking to had no understanding that Bank of America is not a bank in San Francisco or Wells Fargo is not a bank with a stagecoach. These are melded together wide sets of mergers sometimes under stress. Do you think people thought that Wells was – just a bank that went around with a stagecoach. They would coach, like Tom. you to believe that their heritage is a stagecoach going across the plains of America. Right. That's it might have the been their BS. Heritage. That's the, I don't even think it's that. I'm not even going to go there. My point is they're avoiding, it's just like they avoid the fact that they make too much money. They're avoiding the fact that they're a merged hodgepodge of 30 entities. Your That's friend from Massachusetts stuff. would like them all to go back to just being stagecoaches. Stagecoaches that go across the country. <laughs> They have a stagecoach in Minneapolis. Did they? Yeah, I've been there. Cool, nice. I'm sure you have. We've constantly underestimated the resilience of this economy. 
but we are seeing some moderation. There is a long and variable lag to tightening of financial conditions into the real economy. We're seeing disinflation everywhere. We're really seeing deceleration and disinflation in the U.S. economy. We're seeing disinflation in the U.S. economy that is you know, gradually becoming more broad-based. I don't think it changes the move in July from the Fed. They can't take their foot off the pedal yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Three-day winning streak about to become four on the S&P 500. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market positive 0.3% on the S&P. Let's see if that sticks. It's on to earnings away from the data. JP Morgan, Wow City tomorrow morning. This morning, PepsiCo and Delta. Pepsi with a B, Delta Tom with a B and a race to the outlook. <clears throat> Looks like what you saw 90 days ago, I think I mentioned this yesterday or the day before, is that the risk that's out there is we repeat what no one's imagining. I remember the shock and awe exactly 90 days ago when, oh, the revenue growth is pretty good, isn't it? I think that's what I saw this morning. Delta in the pre-market <clears throat> up 4%. PepsiCo up 2.4%. percent delay up 14%. Revenue? Yeah, Impressive. Huge, huge response on Twitter, Cheez-Its and all that. You check out Quaker Oats as well, Tom? I didn't. I didn't you know. get into Quaker it. Oats, Dig yeah. into it. Dig into it. The eye-catching move is beyond the equity market and into the bond market. Yields are lower at the front end of yeah. the curve by 10 basis points. This off the back of the inflation data just yesterday. <laughs> Lisa, yield. this quite intuitive dynamic off the back of that information. Yields down. Aggressively so on a two-year, as you mentioned, Tom, and a dollar weaker against the euro. Strategists also basically saying that the July rate hike, which does seem to be a lock, will be the last in this cycle. And that seems to be an increasing conviction that you're seeing both in Fed funds futures pricing as well as in some of the analyst notes. Key question to me is, what does that imply for the backdrop? What does that imply for the labor market? And every analyst that's come on has said they are waiting to see when that cracks, if there are delayed implications. <coughs> from some of the uh, hikes that have already happened, or if we've achieved it, if we're there, if it's I, Nirvana. I want to hear from the lonely bull crowd, the people that have been on board this rally. I think they've been relatively quiet. John Stolfus at Opco on economics, Neil Dutt at Renaissance. I really want to hear the bull readjustment to the game-changing news of yesterday. The people who had a tough year last year having a better year this year. The people who had a good year last year. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think year. that's very fair. There and are some financial institutions. I can think of one that had a tough year last year and a tough year this year. And talk about that uh, but I time. think but I think what you just said John is a really important observation and so it's the then what and that's where we are into the end of this year well let's talk about where we are right now equities are firmer on the S&P 500 the earnings this morning relative to expectations are better equity <coughs> futures at the moment up by 0.3 percent on the S&P we mentioned the US dollar it's weaker off the back of those lower yields the euro this is a six-day streak now of the euro stronger against the US dollar, Tom. Six days, longest streak since January. I haven't said this in ages. I thought Alan Ruskin and Deutsche Bank really captured it perfectly, but suddenly foreign exchange is a litmus paper of the system and you see it in EM. I don't know, is Damien with us? Or I, I can't keep track of yeah, Damien's he calendar. Is. is he with us? Yeah. Damien Sessa or a Mexican peso is going to be must listen. Lisa, euro dollar, 111.70. I just want to say for the record, Neil Dutta hasn't exactly been quiet. He just recently wrote an article in Business Insider titled Meet no, the Wall I... Street Scaremongers Who Are Totally Wrong About an Imminent Recession. Just saying. Yeah, but, but no, you're absolutely right. You? But I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it's I'm Thursday. Is he going to throw it, me wait under a minute. the bus? It's Thursday. <laughs> What are we going to see in 24 hours after the earnings? What are we going to see at 3 p.m. on Friday? The doom clue comes out to get the clicks on the weekend, and it's 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 just baloney. I mean, it's just not healthy well, for anybody to consume. Here's what I'm looking at, 8.30 a.m. Before that uh, incredible uh, sphere, <laughs> 8.30 a.m., yeah, U.S. producer price index comes out as well as jobless claims. Very curious to see the input prices for companies, which is reflected by PPI, expected to come in more than what we've seen over in the headline prices that companies can charge <clears> the <throat> consumer. That gap is fueling profit margins. Does it start to compress as you see headline nice CP chart. come in as dramatic? 
dramatically as we've seen some of the declines in PPI. Then today we have already gotten Delta and PepsiCo earnings, a raise and a beat over at Delta. We get the earnings calls at 10 a.m. for Delta, 8.15 a.m. Pepsi. Very curious to hear from Delta how long they can keep airplane tickets high. The price is high at a time when we just heard yesterday from the CPI report. They came in 8.1 uh, percent at Bastion saying this, and John pointed to this earlier. Flying is the number one priority for discretionary spending, and I can say that does check out in certain sectors. 6.45 p.m., we hear from Fed Governor Chris Waller. He is the latest when it comes to Fed speak today. Does he basically say, we're there, it's it, this is the soft landing? Does he say, we have to do more? Does he say, we're concerned about X, Y, and Z? Or does he kind of give a sense that, yes, this will be the last hike in the rate hiking cycle? Ramo, forget the Fed. Go rogue. Look down the camera and tell us what you think of Delta. Just, you know, just everyone <laughs> wants it. Been waiting for it for months. I think Delta is a fabulous airline. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Troy Gaisky joined us now. Fair Chief market strategist at <laughs> Fed's Investments. <laughs> Troy, I'm not going to ask you what you think of Delta. <laughs> Let's start with this market. A, is this a mount up? And B, if it is, is it a mount up you want to be a part of? Yeah, so it, it's certainly late stages, we think, of this recent uh, revaluation. Remember, we took multiples back to 15.75 in October. We're, we're now at 19.3 next 12 months earnings, assuming no recession. But that being said, melt-ups can last much longer. We, we think there could be as much as 5% more upside here. <clears throat> and, you know, Lisa brought this up before um, in terms of the labor market and labor market cracking. And, and there are still some incipient signs of that uh, in terms of payroll growth and withholding tax growth that already rolled mm -hmm. negative last quarter and rolled is even more negative so far in Q3. Obviously, we're very early. So when we look forward, it, it, uh, recession is not a guaranteed outcome, but it still looks very highly probable to us, uh, a mild one. Um, and that just means earnings estimates will have to be cut. And, you know, when you have the lowest equity risk premium since the dot-com bubble days, um, and you have multiples back to almost where they were at the end of 21, you know, the risk reward of equities are just not mm -hmm. terribly attractive here. Troy, you are the most competent strategist I know on the, the dynamics of the street wrapped into the strategy. And, and you know, with your, with your work over the years with hedge funds, I want you to talk about what I see every Friday afternoon, which is the analysis of short covering. At some yes. point, short covering plays out, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and look, when you go back to when this rally started, uh, a lot of it was short covering, and that's continued throughout really the last three months. And, you know, we think we're just about to the end of that cycle, but this goes back to John's point before in that, you know, strategies that performed extremely well last year have really been pummeled, and part of that has been anything that you've been short has been highly problematic. Um, but over the next several weeks, it does look like that tactic will play out. And then the question from there to see how much further this rally can go is does some of that five and a half trillion dollars in money market funds start chasing this rally and chasing this rally aggressively? If that's the case, then, you know, this could be a year not like 1999, but certainly something that has materially more upside even from here. And, and then unfortunately, what that means for investors is the starting point of valuations going into 24 will be highly problematic for the next five to seven years equity returns. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a tricky environment to trade. That's for sure, Tom. Where does the money come from that could pile into equities? And I say this at a time when we've heard so many people say that there's money on the sidelines, but that's kind of an inaccuracy. That's kind of an anachronism because it's either in cash or it's in money markets. It's somewhere. It's not just sitting under someone's bed. So where does it come out of? Well, yeah. So, so again, you have five and a half trillion dollars roughly in, in money markets. And, you know, even as the, the Treasury has been replenishing their checkbook very aggressively, most of the cash that's funded that has come out of reverse repo. Um, so if you get a risk on impetus, meaning we end up somehow, some way not having a recession and some of that five and a half trillion, it doesn't have to be a trillion, but two to 300 billion starts rolling in. Um, then you get the next leg higher, which will confuse people even more that look at fundamentals of markets and the economy. Because basically on every metric, we're at extreme valuation levels. And based on every metric, it looks like the forward trajectory of the economy will uh, go into at least a mild recession. 
Which makes me think about what Yuri and Timur over at Fidelity had to say, that the market always inflicts the maximum pain on the maximum number of people. And this 100%. could be the last gasp where it brings everybody in full capitulation before you do see some softening, because there has to eventually be some softening. That's what happens. It could happen in 2030, but it eventually happens. <clears throat> Is that kind of the setup that you're seeing right now? Yeah, it's really that classic setup. And, you know, we, you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Lisa, in terms of capitulation on both sides, right? When you have bottoms like we had in October, you have capitulation on the perma bull crowd or those that have been overly bullish. And when you have these sustained rallies that are just so painful to anyone that's been, let's call it non-constructive, not as positive of markets as, as Dud has been, um, you, you can have capitulation the other way. But then when you look forward from there, you know, it's really a similar setup to the end of 21, where you have very elevated multiples. But the difference now is 22, remember, that was all about Fed tightening, aggressive tightening. The Fed is just about done with that in terms of the front end. We hope they only hike one more time. They probably shouldn't do that. And then from there, they drain their balance sheet. The next 12 months is all about whether the probability of a recession is 60 to 80 percent, like we think, or only 20 to 30 percent, um, like markets are pricing in right now. Great to catch up, Troy. Appreciate it. As always, buddy. Troy Gajewski there of FS Investments. Neil Dutta, Rem Mack, just phenomenal, phenomenal over the last few months, Tom. Just turn around and say things might be better than you think they are. Check out the home builders. Check out the home builders. New highs on the home builders, by the way. I just think it's companies adapting and, frankly, society adapting. Let's make clear here, as, as I'm sure Senator Warren said yesterday on Bloomberg, there's a huge part of society not participating in this. And we'll just look at the commercial real estate and the, 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 the residential real estate challenges across America. But with that said, A, it's a nation with what? One, two percent GDP, maybe more. And B, on a relative basis to other economies, on a global basis, we lead. The home builders from last June, just looking at the <clears> chart, they're up close to 100% off from, the the, from the lows of last off, summer. Off the we're all going to die. It's pretty amazing yeah. to see that develop. Especially at a time when supposedly the housing market's supposed to be falling out of bed. And in fact, home builders are the only inventory that's on the market because nobody's moving because who's going to cash out of their mortgage? Yeah, so this is really a dynamic well, that has just kept on giving for them. Yeah, on the walk up I'm living in, they had, eight, they had eight, eight vacancies, which was a lot versus the last two or three years. They rented five of them in one day. They had eight vacancies. They run at five of how them. How is that walk up going? And, and walk, walk up's going How's okay. Going? Good. You walk up you how know, many flights? 50? Six. No. 56. <laughs> yeah, 56. Exactly. <laughs> I lived in that building. I know the floor. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. Tom, you always gauge how many brand boxes there are. How many brand boxes it's are unbelievable. there? unbelievable. The Amazon thing. Joe Feldman out at Amazon raises his price target off of Prime. Nice. John, did you do Prime? I did do Prime. Prime, <clears> went, Prime went on for two days, though. I, I, I forgot that, that it wasn't a day. It's Prime Days. Joe lots, Feldman lots of raising his price lots. target $20. Lots. If you are just tuning into the program, welcome. Special as always on the S&P 500. <laughs> positive Jobs by 0.3%. <laughs> Coming up, 8 a.m. next hour, Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. I remember not so long ago, he had this target of what was it? I think something like 4,500. And then he yeah. said something like, maybe I'm not bullish enough, Bramo. Maybe <clears throat> that's the the big risk. That was only a couple of months ago. And I remember Tom's response, whoa, can we make some news? 5,000? And he's like, at sure. some point we can get 5,000. Well, now he seems actually prescient because it seems like we're headed toward there and people talking about resistance it, at 4,650 or I don't know. And then it keeps going from there. Ed Yardani does what any Yale PhD would do, frankly, is extend the x-axis. And that's what the, the gloom crew did. And the gloom crew was worried about the next report, this, that, the next Fed meeting. And that, a guy like Yardani and, frankly, on a technical basis, Hank and Port and other bulls are looking out two, three, four, five years to how it sustains. My mystery is, what if technology doesn't give up the, you know, it's assumed that technology can't go further. Uh, okay, what if what if they do go further? I think we said that about Apple's $5 Nvidia, trillion dollar company. 50 percentage points ago. Yeah. It's up 200 percent year to date now. You never told me about Prime Day for you. Did you get involved? No, I didn't get on involved. Prime that Days. goes on there. I, I get home last night, and there's a stack of Hills dog food. From Chewy? Like this, from Chewy. And it's addressed to Car Car, Kennel feed. It's addressed to, I don't know about it. Face cream. All about the face it's cream. It's all face cream. Is that yeah. what you've got? Mm. Oh, okay. Protein, face cream, dog mm. food. Now, obviously, today's data 
um, and, and the string of data that we've been seeing does give um, you know, a, a positive outlook in terms of inflation coming down. My general sense is uh, that our economy remains very resilient and we are seeing inflation uh, come down with a robust jobs market. Leo Brainerd there, the former Fed Vice Chair, now Director at the National Economic Council, advisor to the President of the United States. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Equities right now positive by 0.3%. Decent run of gains on the S&P 500. Three-day winning streak could well become four. A lift to this market, not just on the S&P, but on the Nasdaq too. Into the bond market, yields are lower. After yesterday's move lower, we're down another four basis points on a 10-year to 382. On a two-year, we are down another eight. Just off lows of the year, or rather lows of the session, to be precise, the two-year 466. The two-year actually dropped to as low as something like 350-something. Stunning. At one point, and then came all the way back. 505, 505. Kind of, kind of, kind of amazing to see what yeah. the, the two years done year to date, Tom. Last week through 5.1%, and then coming back off the back of this inflation data in the last 24 hours. PPI, mm -hmm. by the way, add a little bit later on this morning. Was it like three cups of tang ago? We were modeling out 6% money market funds. I said, Tom, coming out of SVB, we dropped to 355 yeah. at the lows <clears> of March. This is on the front end of the curve on the two-year. Then just yeah. last week, post-ADP, drew 5.1%. And here we are again talking about, no, the Fed's done. You're just coming back in again, Bramo. You just wonder where we're going to be next week. Yeah, well, again, narrative shift. Give it another week. All of a sudden, it'll be recession. Oh, my gosh, that's the worst thing ever. Please, can we get them up? We need inflation. We're going to go to yeah, an inflationary spiral. This is, uh, this is a really, really important point. You're dead on, Lisa, about narrative shift, except if you avoid the narrative shifts, one year trailing S&P up 15%. The market's just moving right through. That's the narrative point. shifts that are going on. One final message, Lyle Brainerd, she can take a victory lap for me. Her concept of cumulative, we're at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. You know, and, and there she's sitting with Bloomberg, and people mm. are like, cumulative, right? Mm. And and I think, John, you reached over at to get a, you know, to, to have her pass the wine to you. And, and you know, you <laughs> talked to her about cumulative. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm really trying to bite my tongue. This is aimed cumulative. at no one specifically at the Fed. We cannot sit here and say the Fed deserves a victory lap. I didn't say that. I said no, Brainerd I just, does. I know you did, but I don't think you can talk about anyone attached to the Federal Reserve as deserving of a victory lap. These are the individuals that did not want to begin a hiking cycle based on the belief that inflation was transitory. Now, just because that things are rolling over now does not mean they were right two years ago. They were wrong. They carried that on doing QE. That was two years ago. I'm talking about the last eight sure, months. Sure, so. I, I know, I know, but I've seen a lot of that language in the last 24 hours that the Fed deserves a victory lap, uh, based I, I on what? They're modeling based through on where we are in terms of restrictive, or as Dominic Constum says, super restrictive. And you heard that from Tony Dwyer, who says they're 100 beeps too high right now, which is his statement, not mine, as well. Let us stagger to Jeanette Lowe, who saved the show, Managing Director of Policy Research at Strategus, a Baird uh, company. Jeanette, I'm absolutely fascinated how America digests an end of inflation, a disinflation. To me, it's a two-part America. There's an America prospering now, and there's another America, which the policymakers in Washington have to deal with. It's not participating. Is the divide that great? Uh, good morning. So, I mean, this is definitely something that is going to be um, watched by policymakers. You know, they have been fighting about inflation um, for quite some time against the Fed and now asking the Fed to stop hiking. Um, so there's going to be some careful watches as we go into the next half of the year to see how is inflation impacting uh, the economy and, and what does that mean? Um, so, I mean, I think that obviously, the U.S. has been surprised by how strong the economy has held up um, till now and how much the labor market has held up. But there is definitely going to be um, some concern as we move into right. the second half to see how much does another hike or two um, from the Fed have an impact on the U.S. economy? And then how does that have an impact on uh, U.S. consumers? Mm. And, and how deep may that recession be if we actually get there? To the immediate the presidents are taking, I'll say the phrase to carry it forward from the Fed debate, a victory lap with NATO. He comes home to an American domestic mess. What will he focus on literally in the coming 10 days when he gets home? 
You know, I mean, so I think for Biden, this is one of his big things. I mean, he has been focused on his foreign policy. He has been focused on the fact that he is the, um, you know, the counterpoint to Trump in terms of international engagement. So he is definitely going to be focusing on what he achieved out of NATO. Um, I think one of the things that is important is as he's looking ahead to his reelection, he does want to have stronger support for Ukraine in the immediate term. We saw that coming out of the NATO summit. Um, and he also wants to push for, uh, you know, kind of setting up could there be an end game in Ukraine? Could it be trying to make sure that things are in place so that maybe this could be done before the election comes next year? But over the next couple of days, I think that Biden is going to be focused on what came out of uh, NATO, focused on the fact that we do have more unity within the West. We have more unity with some of our partners in the Indo-Pacific um, that was emblematic of this summit. Um, but then he's also going to be focused on some other key issues, too, um, in terms of in his agenda, you know, kind of Lil Brainer talking about Bidenomics and talking about infrastructure investments, uh, investments in green energy that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act um, and inner uh, chips investments as well. Jeanette, you talked about something that caught my ear, endgame in Ukraine. What does that look like? You know, I think people are really trying to put some bookends around what that could be. There is definitely concern, I think, in Washington that this could be a protracted fight, that we don't actually see one side have, um, you know, come to an end or a complete victory. And so there's trying to be a push, I think, to give Ukraine as many tools as it may have at the time to work on this counteroffensive, to gain some additional territory. And then maybe there could be a negotiated settlement after that. Uh, but I think people are really trying to also think about, could this be lasting longer? Um, and what does that look like for U.S. engagement? We do have a presidential election. There could be a change in leadership. And so they think there's also concern about what that might mean for the future as well. But there's a there's a lot of undecideds. And I think the probably the biggest consensus is that we may not see a complete victory and we're looking for some sort of negotiated settlement. Jeanette Lowe, a strategist. Jeanette, thank you. Thanks for your input this morning on the latest with the president, foreign policy and the recent visit to Lithuania. Just got a message on the Bloomberg Tom, bull market and victory laps. Bull market and victory laps. It, it's a huge debate. I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the screen this morning and I go back to what Englander said. Yesterday was game changing. Everyone's going to reset over the weekend. Can you imagine somebody set lower with a more cautious view, the meetings being taken in the next 48 hours to reset for the end of July? OK, I just think you say victory lap and you're setting yourself up for some real humble pie later on in the year Could because be. we're not Could there be. yet. And the reality is I keep going back to uh, what Tony Dwyer had to say, which is it's fine to have those profit margins expand. But then when the revenue declines, all bets are off. And so that's the heart of the matter. That's the heart of the matter. I if you agree. start to see weakening in the labor market, if people can't keep spending endlessly on airline tickets, just, you know, from a personal perspective, then at that point, you have to imagine all of a sudden it changes the game. OK, but if we get inflation down to two and a half, three percent, which everybody would state is a massive societal victory lap. That still clocks in with nominal <laughs> GDP. It winds you know, me up on we're not, you. We're not back to 1.8 percent. But if you get inflation to a meaningful, sticky point, the bet is from the optimist that you sustain a semblance of the revenue growth that we saw from Pepsi. There's got to be some accountability on these calls, though, TK. You know, you can't just make a call then wait long enough and say they were right. Congratulations. That's the shell game. That's the, mean, the Wall Street game. Well, no, I just don't want to play that game. When can we, oh, when can okay. we play history lesson, though? When can we look back and say the victory lap? It was a, w a winning victory. I, I don't know. But this is fun, though, guys. Is it? Yeah, yeah, another 90 minutes of it. Can't wait. Should not decide. Franklin Templeton. 92. <laughs> <up next>. <laughs> <laughs>is up again this morning on the S&P 500 by 0.3%. Three-day winning streak could well become four. That's what we've got our eye on following earnings this morning from Delta. 
better than expected. A raid to the outlook from PepsiCo. Same thing. Bramo's going to give you some detail on that in just a moment. So equity's doing okay. Another lift on the NASDAQ 100 futures there uh, by 0.6%. The bond market, what a roller coaster, what a ride over the last week. Just kind of nuts. The one week range on a two year, worthy of a one year range on a two year. At the high last week, 511 following ADP. <laughs> and this morning, the two year, 466.82 on the screen. Right now, Tom, down about eight basis points. Bond markets worth looking at. And this is a point I'm, I usually think we underestimate single point analysis, two year yield, 10 year yield, and that. But right now, the spread market's interesting. John, we haven't addressed this yet. Massive disinversion from a negative 111 basis points down to a less inverted yield curve, negative 85 uh, basis points. Now, I don't think anybody's gaming that to go further. Uh, it's not a victory lap for the bond market, but clearly uh, you have to say, boy, have we come a long way in terms of disinverting. In just a week, in just a week, led by a two-year yield, absolutely nosedive. And off the back of that, the dollar's backed away, weaker. Just breathing some life into that trade again over the last 24 hours. The euro stronger for a sixth consecutive session against the US dollar. 111.72, just off session highs. We're firmer there, Lisa, by 0.4%. Let's take a look at some of those names you were talking about earlier, because these are stories that really highlight the strength under the hood of all of the wow. equity gains that we've seen. Pepsi share is up 2.4% after saying that revenue, organic revenue, will probably go 10% this year after a 13% gain last quarter across the board mountain dew gatorade fritos lays pick your guilty pleasure they've all been uh, gaining tremendously and this really speaks to tom Keen's love of, of uh, all sorts of cheeses and things like that but also uh, just the ongoing ability to price along, uh, pass along price increases delta Probably even more interesting, and John, you pointed to this earlier, the chief executive officer, Ed Bastian, saying in an interview with Bloomberg, there is significant growth ahead. Flying is the number one priority for discretionary spending. Not just that, but that also is paired with this idea that oil prices are coming in and people are accepting less service less accommodations, less legroom, less baggage, <laughs> less snacks, and continuing to fly. He's saying prices up, service down. Pretty much across the board. Yeah. And that's what you're continuing to see. And so those profit margins just keep personal, expanding. It's personal well, stock Do you not get on with flight attendants? They're very nice to Oh, me. I always get on with okay, flight good. attendants. Good I'm not flight. one of those people. I mean, honestly, I flew another airline and uh, there was this announcement saying, you know, please report any inappropriate behavior. I, I don't. You what know. was the inappropriate behavior? Well, I just think that they're getting ready. You know, they've, they've oh, reduced like the amount. bracing for it. <laughs> they're right. reducing the amount of alcohol they serve before flights in certain areas because it's, it's an uncomfortable. You keep going experience. back to the lack of alcohol on, on planes. Well, it's just I think that there were a lot of unruly passengers in the immediate aftermath of the what pandemic. Let's move airport? on. What is it about the airport that people go, it doesn't matter what time it is, 6, 7 a.m., normal rules don't apply. Exactly. And they just start drinking. What is that about at the airport? Do you want my psychological analysis? No, please, I'd analysis. love your take on it. Absolutely. There is an underlying level of anxiety and discomfort okay. associated with travel. And people try to offset that with some sort of palliative measures. Okay. That's my take. Interesting. I, I, I think the dangers are so substantial they should solve it this weekend. The FAA has What, no drinking they in should, the air? If, what about before you depart? If you screw up, up at, six, at 25, whatever the feet is, 60,000. No, we don't mean I'm pilots and flight pilots. Pilots. No, 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 no. I'm customers. talking about the passengers. Because I went to a United Airlines lounge once yeah. and saw this guy at the bar with a bow tie on. Pre-12 o'clock. Really? <laughs> Before 12. Well, like Before just, 12. <laughs> just sort of lining them up for us. Well, let's just put it this way. Especially when you travel, you are reminded that it is 5 p.m. somewhere at all times. Really? I will just... On the way to Jackson Hole last year, well, honestly. It's the opposite. It's earlier there. Get to Denver. It's like, you know... Pounding them. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Well, Not just a, just one other name that I want to mention, Disney. When Bob Iger was brought into Disney last this November, is, he was yeah. charged with finding a new replacement. He was given a contract through 2024. He is the replacement. He is a replacement. He found a replacement. It's Bob Iger who's going to be there our, our, through 2026, and those shares are higher. We have this jewel in Los Angeles. is a completely nuts reporter, Lucas Shaw, who is just <laughs> brilliant on the egos of Hollywood. And he said... Iger has no other thing to do but find a successor. Nothing. You know, Dumbo doesn't matter. <laughs> Pinocchio doesn't matter. But Just at some, get at a some successor. point, Tom, you are the successor. He is. Oh, you know, you're absolutely you're right. This is ridiculous. Exactly. Two years. This is and ridiculous. Clearly, he's, clearly he knows 
and I don't know this for sure, but I imagine right. that based on the decisions of the individual before him, Chapek, that some of that right. is coming to light now. And I'm sure that if you're in that seat, you don't want to be seen as responsible for that. So you want to make some of your own changes. I don't know. Do they have the Barbie franchise? I don't even know who is the Barbie movie getting all the buzz. That's Mattel. Is that Mattel? No, but they're not a movie. Are they making it with Disney? I don't even know. But Lucas says it's going to be huge. He says it's a surprise of the summer. It's going to be the Barbie movie. The Barbie movie. Okay. You're you going to see going it? Back cool. to that. No, I haven't seen it. No. I keep telling you where I'm going to. What I'm going to You're watch Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible on, I, I get it. Kennel feed on Saturday. Wants to go to Barbie. Yeah. Go. Warner Brothers, I'm told, is Barbie time. Yeah. Look yeah. at this. Here's a headline. Uh, Chart Banner's got this just out. Delta's fleet of A220s to grow to 131 aircraft. Do they have a guy Johnson would say they don't have the time to make the airplanes? You can't know, get them quick enough. They can't make them quick enough. I mean, yeah. That's the boom economy that we're in, and that's uh, pushing against the gloom. Joining us now, Sonal Desai, CIO of Fixed Income at Franklin Templeton. Sonal, I rarely do this, but I really want to focus, and really it's a legacy of John Templeton, which is you have to get out one year, three year, five year. The Franklin Income Fund, what Ed Perks has done there, he's been with you forever is to me an almost act of God in terms of a sharp ratio. His industry category is negative, pretty moldy statistics, and yet you have delivered solid fixed income returns against the toughest bond market in my lifetime. How did Ed Perks, how did Franklin Templeton do that? It's Ed Perks. Ed Perks and his team are amazing. And yes, they're absolutely living up to the living up to the Franklin and the Templeton, uh, up to uh, up to our right. cultural background, I'd say, and uh, absolutely being very active, being very careful to adjust duration in a careful way, picking individual, right. individual pieces. And yeah. I think that's how you do it. Chanel, it, it, what's so important here is, is in, the, in the equity markets to win by 200 basis points, 300 basis points, a big deal. You guys are beating the bond disaster by 500, 600, 700 basis points. Now what? What's the next step for something blended like the Franklin Income Fund? I think there's a lot up ahead. Ed is, uh, and I want to be very careful and very, very clear here. Ed Perks runs his group very independently from the fixed income team. And I would say that looking at what our call is in terms of uh, duration, et cetera, et cetera, we are looking going forward as there being a time when duration will become interesting. There is no doubt. Right now in the fixed income group, we continue to be relatively neutral. I don't want to speak for the income group, which actually works separately. Sanal, you still believe that we're going to see a sell-off in bonds, particularly at the long end. Do you hold that conviction even after what we saw yesterday with CPI and the expectations that we'll see some sort of reiteration of that disinflation today with PPI? Oh, I think we're going to see the disinflation. Nobody expected disinflation never to happen. So I would simply note a couple of things. I was listening to you talk about the victory laps earlier today. And absolutely, this was an unambiguously positive number. That is good news. Having said that, I would point to three different factors. Atlanta wage fed in, uh, wage uh, indicator increasing at 6%. That's wages increasing at 6% right now. Looking at the rally that you've been talking about in equity markets, we have essentially unwound financial conditions to about 400 basis points ago. That is when the Fed started raising rates. Look, I get it. There's going to be, you know, a lot is not captured in financial conditions, but that rally does continue to counteract what the Fed has been doing by raising rates. And finally, nobody's talking very much about it, but fiscal policy is rather loose and it remains loose for the next several years right now at current points. Not expecting a massive pickup in inflation, but I think it's way too early to be calling victory laps, especially on pork. I think it's gonna be sticky and it's gonna be sticky for longer. The other piece I would say is that it is interesting looking out further into three years, four years, five years down, because absolutely, I think uh, Fed neutral rate, which is still stuck at 2.5%, that thing is going to inch up. It needs to go up because 2.5% doesn't make sense. 
Sonal, how much conviction do you have then to really move against, trade against the, the, the sea change that we're seeing expressed in markets where people are pricing out further rate hikes after this month? Well, no, the so rate hikes after this month are up in the air, absolutely. I think what's really wrong, though, is assuming you're going to get rate cuts as the other side of that. You're not going to get rate cuts. While this year's rate cuts are largely in the process of being priced out, I think probably there's an assumption that you're going to get too many rate cuts next year still. So, you know, will the Fed do another one and then pause? Likely. Do I think it's a straight line from 3% down? Actually, unlikely, even on the headline, because we are going to see the peak impact of base effects over the next few months. And also, I think we end the year with core inflation continuing to be pretty much twice what the Fed's target would be and twice maybe as much as 4 4% plus on core. So, yeah, headline will come down, but I don't think that core is coming down quite as quickly. Interesting. So now, wonderful coverage, as always. So now, Desire there of Franklin Thanks. Templeton. Mike McKee went through those base effects yesterday and how they develop as we go through the summer and beyond. Lisa Apollo, Torsten Slock, up in about 50 minutes. He's talked about those long and variable lags over the next 12 to 18 months and pushing back against the hopes and dreams of a soft landing in America. What I'm curious from him is what is he looking at in terms of labor market softening? That's what some people talk about as sort of a key indicator of what's to come, what's the time frame and how he interprets the base effects versus the true disinflation that we're seeing right now. And when that tightening effort, Tom, begins to hit the economy. Well, you know, it hits the economy. And I'm glad you mentioned it, John, because we're talking all markets today. But, oh, yeah, the economy and there's still a, not maybe not a recession call out there, but a slowdown call. Sure. And let's not forget that. I, I mean, you can talk about the financial end of this, but then there's the GDP end of it. With that said, you look at the optimists out there that don't get enough cred right now. And what if we get another 2% GDP, two and two? We'll give them no a victory lap. Well, no they one's modeling that. Lap. They can for our money. We'll give them that. We'll no, give them that. No one's modeling. I'm serious. No one's modeling. We know you're serious. GDP. It's okay. Don't worry. You know, I'm not, you know, just winding you up a Where's bit. Europe right now? Flat? Europe, yeah, today. Yeah. Flat? Like on the day? No, no. Oh, there's some GDP. parts of Europe done really. Oh, Germany's growth. Germany's like really difficult. Growth, yeah. No, recession. Yeah. And, and, and China, the numbers overnight again, not, not stellar. But most people in the financial media and real, the political media will say that there's no American exceptionalism. We're flat on our back. And the answer is no, no, we're not. Delta's minting money. Yeah, PepsiCo Maybe too. That's, you know, sure. I'm sorry. If you are just tuning into the program, welcome. The S&P 500, positive 0.3%. As I mentioned, Torsten Slock of Apollo coming up at 8.30 Eastern Time. Don't miss that. Andrew Hollenhorst of City, just building on the work from yesterday, publishing moments ago. 25 basis point July rate hike remains likely. We've been expecting a subsequent hike in September, but recent data raised the probability it's delayed to November. So they may be pushing this out a little bit, not just yet, but starting to flirt with that idea. Upcoming data may not, not, not look some so sanguine. That's their view. Wage growth and how it starts to bleed into overall inflation in months to come. Non-farm payrolls come down under 200,000, maybe, you know. I mean, there's a lot of people. David Kelly's been leading on that at J.P. Morgan. You, you get that ad. But, you know, so so we got the July meeting and then there's a September meeting. Is that the new hawkish pause? Jackson Hole's going to be a great forum, Tom. Platforms there if they want to communicate. To me, it's it. a bigger mystery than last year, frankly. Hopefully you'll speak for one minute more. What, we get nine minutes. Nine anything. minutes. <laughs> Nine minutes. We're going to be there, right? Late August. We're going to be there. A lot of planning Very going cool. into it. A great group of people scheduled to be there with the Kansas City Fed. Nice. Who's the Kansas City Fed president now? I don't think they have one yet. <laughs> they're going to sort that out for Jackson Hole. <laughs> no, but there's their baby puppy to pivot, and pivot will still be Esther there. George was yeah. always so welcoming. She was. She was lovely. She's wonderful. What happened? What happened, Tom? They won't move at the meeting after July. They'll take a break just like they did this last time. And then we're going to get to November 1st. Well, it's a long time between now and November 1st. I can imagine by that point, it's possible that they'll see enough news that makes them confident that they've done enough. So I think I think the November uh, rate hike is really up, up for grabs at this point. They won't move.
move at the meeting after July. They'll take a break just like they did this last time. And then we're going to get to November 1st. Well, it's a long time between now and November 1st. I can imagine by that point, it's possible that they'll see enough news that makes them confident that they've done enough. So I think I think the November uh, rate hike is really up, up for grabs at this point. We're already talking about November. It is um, July 13th. Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president, Bloomberg opinion columnist. That's the argument right now. A lot of people starting to say one and done for the Federal Reserve, one more hike this month, then they might be done. I think other people pushing back over the last 24 hours to suggest that even if they are done in September, maybe they have to go again in November because the base effects, Lisa, start to kick in in a different way. And all of a sudden you could see a re-inflation. There's also a discussion I haven't heard enough of, which is if this is one and done for the Fed, a longer period of rates at this level, could that end up being more harmful, more restrictive to the economy than many people are factoring? Maybe not uh, later this year, but certainly early next year. But certainly you listen to stories and how they're told about why we need higher interest rates. The inflation data yesterday has changed those stories in a material way, Tom. And Steve yeah. Englander, you've quoted him all morning over at Standard Chartered. He called it a game changer. There was a lot to like about that inflation print. Well, there's a game changer, and you see it in the, the depth of the market, the foreign exchange market as well. I would just suggest that what's so important uh, to me here is just the optimists having their day and the rationalization that's going on in spades this morning, getting to earnings season starting tomorrow. The industry's rationalization meter right now is pegging hard right. Yeah, the Fed's going to be very focused on month-over-month month core inflation, Tom, and there was a lot to like yesterday. Will there be a lot to like next month, the month after that, and the month after that? By definition, they'll be ex post. And the question is, how much ex post is a really important question, John. Is it out to September, or does it even go out further uh, than that? What do we got from Steve Englander here? This is a quote from Steve. Do you want the quote now? Please. I can get to the quote from Steve uh-huh. on CPI. Likely to be a game changer. <laughs> Goes on to say, we doubt that the Fed will hike again after the July 26th meeting. This is the one and done camp with Steve Englander. This reduces the risk of being long carry and high beta currencies. Demet Sasak can translate that for you in a moment, Tom. By reducing the fear of being blindsided by an upward shift in the terminal Fed policy rate. It's just taking away that uncertainty just a little bit yeah, going through summer. just a little bit. And you see it in the market this morning. I would note NASDAQ up seven-tenths of a percent. Joining us right now to sort this out, and particularly within the depth of the most important market, foreign exchange, Damien Sassauer, Chief Emerging Markets Credit Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. This is an historic moment, Damien. I can say with all my thinking, da-da-da, Mexican peso crisis, never at 21 peso did I ever think <laughs> Mexico could launch and breach through 17 to a 16 handle on peso. To me, it's borderline 30, 40 years historic. Why is this happening? Why is peso and other EM on fire? Well, a lot of people would have you believe with, with respect to Mexico that it's the whole theme of nearshoring, right? Taking the place of China, it's you know, bringing that. it all back. It's so much more. It's actually two things in my mind. It's politics and it's remittances. Remittances from the U.S. to Mexico, from the diaspora, 27% in 2021, 13% last year. It accounts for 4 to 5% of Mexican GDP now. Remittances are a big deal for Mexico, but more importantly, the political scene. Andres Manuel López Obrador has been a bastion of 50-plus percent approval ratings in an environment across LATAM where your leaders are running 20 to 40% approval ratings, right? What that means is that the election coming up next year, uh, Claudia Scheinbaum, uh, female Jewish uh, mayor of Mexico City, Morena, She's probably going to slide right into that seat. There's going to be continuity in Mexico, which is something you don't see in many emerging markets. So what do we have? We have dollar mex up, what, 20% year to date, 50% since 2021, and crazy numbers. So when Steve Englander gets out and starts talking about the EM carry trade, I kind of just want to fade that a little bit because we've seen some real big gains already. I right. get what he's saying. The path for dollar weakness is there. But, you know, if you bet against the dollar and EM, you're probably not going to last. Is long. there a bet on the street that DXY goes through and goes ever strong, uh, goes weaker dollar uh, forward? Well, I think, you know, Troy Gajewski hit on it a little bit earlier. You know, we expected, I think the market expected to see some speed bumps due to the replenishment of the TGA. And now you're not seeing that the, the the general account here in the U.S. Basically, that would be dollar strong, bullish for the dollar. If you saw some, you know, liquidity pockets of illiquidity in the U.S., you're not seeing that. There's no, I mean, that risk has gone out the door. And this is the second largest rebuild of the Fed's reserves, pretty much on record. And yet the market's not reacting to it anymore. You know, the reserve repo facility is acting as it should. 
I mean, so yeah, I guess dollar bears are, you know, kind of, you know, flexing their muscles here off the back of that. And, you know, I get it. Do you think that it has staying power based on the fact that you just said you'd fade some of the gains we've seen in EM? Well, here's the thing. I do think it has staying power, but it's so tough to say. I mean, the amount of stimulus that was injected into the economy, we don't know when it's going to break. We don't know where it's going to break. But eventually, when you start tightening conditions, things get tough for a lot of different pockets of the market. And so, you know, I, I remain sort of skeptical. Does that mean I go ahead? head first into the EM carry trade? No, but certainly, you know, I can see some currencies out there. I mean, let's think about the EM currencies which are rallying today. It's not the Brazils, the Colombias, the Mexicos, the high yielders. It's the South Koreas, the Malaysias, the low yielders, the Taiwan dollars. Those are historically funding currencies. So if you're long the EM carry trade and you're funding in those currencies, you're probably losing money today. Well, not losing money, but it's, it's kind of a wash. So, you know, it really is about your choice of funding currency. And the Japanese yen right now, which is the one that basically everyone's kind of pointing to as you know remaining weak, um, yeah, I mean you could probably see some 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 cracks in that as well. And you know I'm not going to go into why, but you know I mean look, you know yield curve control in Japan and. Yeah, you know, it could definitely it could definitely go the other way. We were talking with Alan Ruskin earlier about the weak dollar call, and he sees euro uh, really gaining supremacy. Yeah. There is a question though about the growth differentials, and at what point the growth and the resilience in the U.S. attracts a certain degree of investment. How does that pair with the developing world, which is already facing the lag effects and is seeing a lot of potential slowdowns? So what I'm looking for, it's a great question. I mean, what I'm looking for is negative feedback loops. So I'll give you an example, Sweden, right? And this is JP Morgan speaking, not me, but it's so true. I mean, they basically raised rates to bring down growth. What that's done is it's taken down the currency, the stokey. And what that's done is it's kept inflation artificially high, forcing the central bank to continue to raise rates even more than it can to stoke off inflation, right? So which other countries kind of fall into that camp? Because that negative feedback loop is very, very difficult to break. So I look at South Korea, some others, but you know, that is an area of the market that are not a lot, I just right. don't think a lot of people are focused on. But people today, and you know, I, I don't mean to take a long-term JP Morgan view on, on what's going on in the Nordic states, but if we have an Englander game changer now, is it where every strategy team has to rip up the script <laughs> just to get to Monday? Are they uh, going to reset for the end of July? Only if they want to sell their script, right, Tom? I mean, look, it, you know, fake news, all that kind of stuff. I mean, look, I don't see a lot of people kind of at mid-year kind of, you know, 360, 180-ing their calls. I still think there's going to be risk of inflation remaining sticky and high. I think, you know, you probably might not see the Fed cuts materialize as you otherwise would. Going back to Mexico, we're not expecting, you know, them to get inflation to 3%, which is their target, until the end of 2024. So you can see rates high, sticky for far longer than the markets are pricing in right now. When does Messi get here? Ah, uh, he's here. He's here. He's I arrived. I think the jet arrived. Yeah, at Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport, you know. And, <laughs> I mean, I track Messi, of course. Evid evidently. Um, you you and, managed and, to get some tickets. When we got to get, I mean, how much tickets are going for? I know. Here, playing Red, Red Bull. Bull, it was $40 before he joined into Miami. Tickets for that game are now five, dollars $600. Crazy. That's ridiculous. He is, what, what is the deal? $150 million for two years? And that's not including Adidas or okay. Apple. Adidas. I mean, that's the crazy. Of the Adidas. It's awesome. He's the best. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> What's he like on the field with MLS type players versus Spanish players or Premier League players? If he came five years ago, <laughs> he'd crush he them. Been, <laughs> would, have been, would have been pretty embarrassing on a weekly basis. He slowed down a bit. He slowed down. He a bit slowed last down, but his MLS gotten better. It's improving, Damien. Can we say that? Well, Jonathan, isn't he bringing over a couple of his mates from Barca? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I mean. Come I mean, on, we have it's, some homegrown It's, like, it's, like, it's like a reunion, right? Yeah, yeah. it's going to be fun. It's what do be I want to see. watch at Wimbledon this weekend? I mean, I'm, you know. I'm, Alcaraz is so good, huh? Oh, he's years awesome. Old. He's awesome, man. Oh, awesome. 20 years old. It's, it's nuts. Number one in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's just awesome. Awesome I mean, to see. Okay. I mean, I'm so excited. I mean, I hope he can do it. I mean, who, Joker won, right? So, yeah. You know, I mean, and. It's going yeah. to be some interesting semifinals tomorrow. Is, is this heat a story with three out of five sets? Is, is temp temperature, is the weather bad there now? Is the weather bad in England? Yeah, is it yeah, hot? Yeah, it's often bad in England. Well, did no, you see the nice grass? The grass is actually looking a little brown the there. The yeah, I know so. Bad weather. <laughs> we just live for that bad weather, <laughs> Ramo. Oh, exactly. We live, we live I'm just seguing here in the tennis on when we're totally The Sina Djokovic tomorrow and Alcaraz, Danny Medvedev. So look out for that men's semifinals. Women's semifinals a little bit later. From New York City, Damien, thank you. This was great. Let's do more on Messi in the next couple of weeks. That'll be cool. Welcome back to another special Wimbledon update from Bloomberg TV and radio from Tennis Channel. I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. The last American man standing in London is out. 
Chris Eubanks' dream run at the All England Club came to an end in a five-set loss to former U.S. Open champ Daniil Medvedev. 28 aces and 52 winners for the third seed in the victory, while 55 unforced errors told the story of the match for Eubanks. And don't forget, you can watch all the action daily at 5 p.m. Eastern on Tennis Channel. I do think that the lagged effects of policy are finally catching up and that we are going to go to a sub 1% growth rate. The economy is in pretty good shape even though growth is slow, but inflation has been coming down. The frustration here is seeing the Federal Reserve still tighten to fight a battle they've already won. They won't move at the meeting after July. They'll take a break just like they did this last time. They may be reluctant to cut until they see more evidence that the labor market is imbalanced. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene. Game changer Thursday here, stealing from Stephen Englander, Standard Charter. Something in the air changed yesterday. And John, for the Fed, for fi uh, financial participants, it was disinflation. Yeah, forget July. They're going to hike. Most people assume they will. It's after that. Perhaps they're done. That's the view from a lot of people this morning. Others, the likes of City, thinks that perhaps you'll get another one in November. But ultimately, there was a lot to like about the data yesterday, showing some disinflation in America. Can that continue? A couple of questions we've got about the earnings right now, Tom. Doubter, fantastic. Beat and a raise. Discretionary spending, a dominant story there. It's pretty decent. Unemployment's at 3.5%. Inflation's moving in the right direction. Is that yesterday's story, TK? Or can that persist through the rest of 2023? Well, we're going to find out here in a moment. Our conversation of the day, Ed Yardeni to be with us here in uh, moments. And John, the wraparound here from the Yardeni and Compora low in October is what do you do if you're in the triple leveraged all cash fund? What do you do if you're a bear? What if you do? What do you do if you're short right now? If you missed 40%, and that move on the Nasdaq, or just blended. Let's say it's eighteen percent. You missed eighteen percent, whatever. Yeah. Then you missed out. You're wondering if you should get in. Lisa, can <clears> you sit this out any longer? That will be the key issue, especially for institutions that have cash uh, allocations that they could potentially start to funnel into equities. Key issue for me, and I'm very curious to hear what Ed Yardeni has to say about this: is profit margins. We're about thirty minutes away from PPI, the differential between the prices that some of these companies can charge, and their costs, which have gone down, has allowed them to enjoy expanding right. profit margins. When does that shift? When does that reverse? And what's the response? Let's drive it forward to Friday, the beginning of the large bank earnings seasons. How have the big banks adapted? To me, it's all about corporations adapting. It's a it's a financial media with a static analysis where corporations are working in a dynamic environment. To me, the big banks are going to adapt. And once again, they're going to be embarrassed, John, at their profits. They're going to hide how much money they're making. Tomorrow is about credit quality. If you go through a lot of the analyst notes, yeah, looking ahead to uh, yes. JP Morgan, yeah. to City, to Wells, credit quality, loan losses, loan loss reserves. They've been guiding and most people have been guiding to pretty low expectations around that, Tom, across a number of these banks, particularly yeah. on the trading side of the business as well. So the bar's been set pretty low going into the financials tomorrow and we'll see how they deliver. And the data, John, I'm just going to go to the real yield, which is stunning. We're at 1.80% on the 10-year, five-year real yield, way, way out over the last number of days, that fear of a rising inflation. 10-year yield from a 1.80 back to 1.55. That's disinflation. And that's the bond market. Let's get to equities. Gearing up potentially for a fourth consecutive day of gains on the S&P 500. Equities up here by 0.4% in the FX market. Six days of this now. Six days of euro strength and dollar weakness. Euro dollar, 111.79. Tom, we're pushing 112, that currency pair positive, by almost 0.5%. The hallmark of the show has always been to keep score. We take careful care with those that get it wrong. We really pay attention to those that get it right. This is no surprise to anyone over the decades to know with a longer time frame, a longer perspective, the gentleman from Yale once again has nailed it. Edward Yardeni joins us, president of Yardeni Research. What were you thinking, not the third week of October, the low, but let me say the first week of October, the hysteria there, the gloom. How are you framing out the optimism that got this really well, I, going? I, I watch uh, sentiment in the equity market very carefully, and uh, there's something called the investor's intelligence yep. old bear ratio. And uh, <clears throat> in mid-October, it got down to 0 0.60, which is as depressed as it was in March of uh, 20, uh, 2009. 
And I was thinking, surely things aren't anywhere near as bad as they were back then. And uh, I, I've also been in the of the view that uh, we're not going to have a uh, economy wide recession. I was of the view that we've been in a rolling recession. Uh, so it all kind of came together for me by the end of October. And I said, you know, I think October 12th was the low. Do you think we can carry on beating up low expectations? Well, the problem now is that uh, there's uh, too many bulls. Uh, you know, we've nothing to fear but fearless investors. Uh, we don't really have enough pes- – I mean, the technical sentiment picture isn't that, that uh, good because there just aren't enough pessimists out there. But the problem is the fundamentals are really good. Uh, you know, I think everybody's uh, uh, swung around from worrying about an economy-wide recession to sort of embracing a disinflationary soft landing. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with the PPI. But, uh, you know, we could have a trifecta of really great numbers. Expected inflation on Monday was lower than than expected. And uh, the CPI was great. And I think the PPI is going to be very good as well. So disinflation is here. Will bank earnings validate some of the optimism? I think so. I think uh, we are going to see a continuation, as you pointed out, of an increase in uh, loan loss reserves. Uh, The Fed actually puts out a weekly series on that for large banks and small banks. For the large banks, it's actually up 16% on a year-over-year basis. So there, there could be some disappointment on earnings from that from that perspective. Uh, but much depends on the economy. If uh, people embrace the, the view that the economy can continue to grow, then credit quality is not going to be that big an issue. And they may be able to, within a few quarters, just to reduce those loan loss reserves, and suddenly the profits are looking pretty good again. Months ago, you were talking about 4,500. How high have you gone in terms of an S&P forecast? Yeah, I, I've actually been uh, – I'm going to raise you by 100. <laughs> I've, I've been talking about 4,600. Okay. Uh, but what's the difference? Uh, you know, it's been a bull market since October 12th. And uh, the problem with 4,600 is we're awfully close to that. That was my year-end target. And it, it looked delusional earlier this year, I have to admit. Uh, but it's worked out awfully well. Uh, we're only, what, uh, you know, 150 uh, points away from that, maybe less than that. Um, so uh, let's get to 4,600 and then ask me again, but I'll probably raise it to 4,800 depending on how things are, are shaping up. How do profit margins fit into this? Because we were speaking earlier about the likelihood right. where we could see a shifting narrative there, especially if revenues mm-hmm. come in the way that Tony Dwyer was right. talking about. Do you see things differently? Well, we, we have had a uh, earnings recession, a very mild one. Uh, it looks like earnings are going to be down about 8% on a year-over-year basis during the second quarter, and that should be the worst of it. And then we start to progressively see better comparisons and a positive comparison by the fourth quarter. Uh, interestingly, this earnings recession hasn't been uh, attributable uh, to revenues. Revenues for S&P 500 are at an all-time record high, so clearly it's been the profit margin. So the profit margin has been getting squeezed for the past year or so. Uh, but I see signs uh, in weekly data that we uh, monitor uh, looking at forward earnings and forward revenues that suggest that analysts are seeing signs that uh, revenues are – that profit margins are bottoming. I, I look at you, Denny, at the past here, and it's so easy to go back and do some analog with 10 years ago or 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. The fact is when you know we first knew Edward Yardeni at C.J. Lawrence, you were with Lou Rukeyser talking about the public in individual stocks. Now we are overwhelmed with index fund investment Correct. and ETF investment. How does that change the dynamics of the market optimistically or right. negatively given these new instruments? Well, it's very frustrating for individual investors and certainly for institutional investors that uh, uh, we're taught that diversification is an important aspect of managing a portfolio. And suddenly we have uh, the, the mega cap H stocks that account for 27% of the S&P 500. So, uh, you know, if you don't have 27% of your portfolio in those stocks, you've been underperforming. So it's a lot of pressure to, you know, play that game to, you know, continue mm-hmm. to buy into that, um, that group of stocks. Um, but it is what it is. Um, right. th- these are great companies and uh, they're uh, – I, I think it all really started, uh, you know, with when Facebook realized that uh, their stock was getting hammered. They said, "Well, we can show everybody just how much we really make. All we got to do is cut our expenses, and that's easy enough." And that's what a lot of them did. And then the AI thing. Uh, uh, happened. So, what's the theme for twelve months forward? What's the next theme for corporate America to perform? Well, my theme is uh, I tend to focus on longer term themes. My theme is uh, the Roaring Twenty Twenties, which again looked quite delusional over the past uh, f- few years. 
Uh, but uh, the decade isn't over, and there's still time for it to run. And I think, in, I think technological innovation is going to make a big difference. John, the analog there is the pandemic of 1918, 1919, yeah. boom, right into the roaring 20s. You coined the term bond vigilantes. Yep. Can you offer us your analysis on the bond market right now, treasuries specifically? Well, it's interesting how well the bond market's been doing in an environment where the Fed's been raising short-term rates quite aggressively and in an environment where we have quantitative tightening, where they're actually letting their securities mature. There's clearly been a, a tremendous demand for, uh, for bonds. Um, I think a lot of it is... Uh, there's a tremendous amount of liquidity out there still. Uh, I, I know people have focused on M2 and uh, have had a, a, a doomish scenario because M2 has been declining. But M2 is still about a trillion dollars above its pre-pandemic trend line. Demand deposits are also something uh, more than that, actually. We've, M2 has never been more liquid. Is there an obvious relationship at the moment between how treasuries have performed and what equities have been doing? Yeah. What is it? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, last year they were both doing uh, horribly. It was uh, something we hadn't seen in quite some time. Uh, now I think uh, both asset classes have done quite well. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the, the bonds have at least earned you the coupon. They haven't really hurt you. I, I'm looking at the the bonds to uh, – I think the bonds peaked at 4.2% uh, uh, on October 24th, I would believe, uh, last year. A lot of good things happened in October of last year, and – so I, I think the bonds are okay, and uh, I think stocks uh, st still have upside, especially in the laggards like financials and industrials. So you think even if the Fed sticks at, say, 550 and just holds it there, this equity market's okay? Well, you know, the, the, the Fed's been kind of telling different stories. Uh, when individual uh, Fed officials have been talking, they've been uh, awfully hawkish. But when they get together and put together their summary of economic projections, they've been very reasonable. They said, look, we want to get it up to a restrictive level. Uh, I think they're there. The banking crisis, I think, demonstrated that they're there. It's restrictive enough, and I think they want to keep it there. I, I never was in that camp that believed that the Fed was going to lower interest rates. I took them at their word. I, I think they could declare mission accomplished, except that's a jinx. So it's better that they don't do that and that they continue to talk Can hawkish. Can they take a victory lap? Well, I, I, I hope they don't. Uh, you know, victory laps are jinxes, you know. There you go. <laughs> I, I've, I've had a few of those in my career, only to be wrong the, 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 almost the yeah, next that's day. That's our theme this morning, Ed, when you weren't here. We, they were busting my chops about victory laps. Well, yeah, Ed, we yeah. won't call this a victory lap for you, but certainly so far, no, so good. No, don't do that. <laughs> so far, so good. Ed, it's yeah. good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. From New York City this morning, good morning. Welcome to the program. Equity futures right now positive by 0.4%. Coming up very shortly, 8.30 Eastern time, about 20 minutes from now, actually, Torsten Slocktom of Apollo. We'll talk to him about that PPI data just around the corner. It's a really important uh, conversation. Torsten's had a huge value add, not only with his time at Deutsche Bank, but, you know, what is it, like 8 o'clock every day he comes out with an insight, a single chart, you know, one idea from the huge compendium of research. I've loved his research. Yeah. The focus at the moment, as we've talked about all week, long and variable lags, Bramo. For Torsten, that's been the focus over the last couple of days. He was talking about soft landing for a while. Now it's moved to recession is the most likely scenario because of said 12 to 18 month long and variable lags, which he says hit, will hit the market at some point in the near future. Would you like me to stick around to talk about airlines? I would love we, it. Oh, that'd be great. But okay, you don't want we to can do, do that. You? No, I'm happy to. We can talk about Delta. You want to talk about United and American and Bramo's going to give us a rant on and Delta Airlines and... How she feels. You know, how she feels about transferring in, in, in Atlanta. I saw one that, of those, was, that was, that was, that was, I saw one of those flight track tweet things. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, the yeah. busiest day since time began. Yeah. And they can really count it. It's, it's extraordinary. I see that every summer. Same thing, isn't it? Airports. But terrible. this is worse, yeah. right? Well, yeah. People life yeah. blogging the weather. You notice that too? Have you noticed the life block of the weather? Yes. Like everywhere. I have seen that. All these media organizations life block in summer. Well, and time's still watching Jet TV. Love that. Love that. We're seeing disinflation everywhere. Uh, we're really seeing dis uh, deceleration and disinflation in the U.S. economy. I see plenty of signs that inflation is just fading away here. Um, and the frustration here is seeing the Federal Reserve still tighten uh, to fight a battle they've already won. David Cully, outspoken there. Global strategist, chief global strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management on the latest inflation data. The Federal Reserve, in the minds of many, set to hike interest rates once again at the end of this month. 
a little less than two weeks from now. Two weeks yesterday. Equities at the moment up 0.4% on the S&P 500. The earnings so far so good this morning at least. PepsiCo a beat, Delta a beat and a raise. Lisa and I mentioned in this quote from Ed Bastin, the CEO, a few times this morning. We can do that again. Speaking to Bloomberg in an interview, there is significant growth ahead. Discretionary spending, Tom, flying the number one priority for discretionary spending. Yeah, one of this is sort of a Helene Becker thing at Cowan, but the idea, John, here that regular travelers, mere mortals like Lisa Abramowitz, are taking the business class seats up front because they've got this promo, that promo, I'm those not. miles. Credit card points. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But there's a it's really interesting dynamics right now. Fake news. What we're going to do now is dive it's into this. Real news. And for all, yeah. <laughs> not in business class. Carry on. <laughs> we're going to dive into this with somebody truly expert in this. George Ferguson is at Bloomberg Intelligence. I put him in a category with a giant Kaivon rumor over at Cowan as well, with decades and decades of experience on this. George, I've never asked this question on air, but I think it's on the mind of everyone. We're jammed. We're at capacity that you sit on the runway, the whole thing. From where you sit, is there an integrity within American aviation where George Ferguson can say it's safe to fly? I think I can say it's safe to fly. I think it's... uh... I think it's, it's a well-regulated industry. I think the people in it care a lot about safety. Uh, you know, the accident levels have diminished to, to nothing in the U.S. Uh, from, you know, a couple of years back in the 80s. I think it is safe to fly. If there's an algebraic equation, it's got four, five, six, seven George Ferguson factors in it. Which is the factor that allows for growth Given population growth, given prosperity in America, is it we need more gates, we need more planes, we need more flight attendants? Which is the factor that matters? So I think it is we, we need more pilots. Uh, you know, employees are definitely a problem right now, but I think longer term, the training of pilots, the bringing them into the industry, I think it's a challenge that's going to overhang for a number of years. We have a lot of retirements coming up. So I think the airlines really have to be thinking about that. We were talking and John quoted Ed Bastian of Delta saying that the number one thing people are using the discretionary funds on is flying around the world. And this comes after a two year hiatus during the pandemic where people were basically homebound. How long can this you only live once the YOLO of the consumer, both in America and elsewhere, continue? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question we all have. Right. So when you look at Delta's earnings this morning, quite strong back to 2019 levels of profitability. You look at what they've guided to in 3Q, looks like a similar quarter. You know, leisure is really leading this, uh, the recovery here. Business not back yet. I think they're selling some of those business class seats at a bit less than what they were selling them for in 2019. Europe was really, really strong. And this is the summer where everybody went, look, I haven't been to Europe in three, four years. I got to get back there and I'm going to pay whatever it takes to get there. I don't know that we get this next year. I don't know that this bounce, this leisure bounce persists, especially I don't know if this leisure bounce persists as we get into this, you know, the effect of higher interest rates. If the economy slows, that's a challenge I think uh, we have. Have these airline companies shored up their balance sheet sufficiently in the case that it doesn't continue, in the case that American travelers look at the cross currents of the dollar and the euro and where the euro is and potentially strengthening versus the dollar and say, we're not going to go to Europe and they're not going to buy those tickets? So I don't think they've done it yet, right? But we did see a debt pay down in this last quarter by Delta. They are using their cash to try to get their balance sheets back to to square it away, but they're not there yet, but working on it. We also have seen costs come in quite a bit, led by oil prices down about 24% year over year. They also have created efficiencies in places like snacks and bags and Base. basically space. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go yeah. there. I'm not a, I'm not a purveyor uh, frequently of the uh, booze offerings on the flight. But I'm curious from your vantage point how much further they can squeeze, squeeze the consumer before they start pushing back and saying, I need a little more leg room than, you know, a tin box. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th- I think it's already starting, right? So we already saw uh, Fed data come out the other day that showed fares down 8%. Uh, so I think I think consumers are are starting to look for lower fares. 
the domestic yields that we saw from Delta for this earnings season grew by nothing since last year. So on the domestic market, I think the consumer is starting to push back a, a little bit. And, and again, if the economy tightens, that will well, continue. Go ahead, sir. George, we, we booked you only for therapy for Lisa. <laughs> so, you know, it's with, we're with Dr. George. For those of you well, just joining us became. on radio and TV, oh, Dr. George is with us from Bloomberg <laughs> Intelligence here on Terminal C at Hartsfield. Hey, George, final one from me on just on international. <clears throat> Do you get the sense that first class is coming to an end? Uh, yeah, again, we've done some analysis on fares, and first class has done okay, but I think not the fares aren't as good as they were when business was traveling more. So I, th I think you're getting, again, a bit of upsell for leisure that isn't quite as good as business. And again, if the economy gets a little softer, that could be harder to do, and I think it, it will. George, one final question quickly here. Is Boeing, have they lost their game? Have they lost their step? They had some pretty nice delivery uh, numbers for uh, the quarter and for the month of June. Uh, look, it's taken them a little bit longer to get their mojo back. They went into the downturn uh, with the max, you know, uh, grounded in those difficulties. Uh, they're, I think they're still a great company. It's taken a little more time to get back going, though. John, this is fascinating. Sure, yeah. And to you, I think you know, you know, it's an Airbus market, but this mm. is all new for America that Boeing's not on its game. George, one final, final, final. No, I'm joking. George <laughs> Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence. George, we're out of time. It's great to catch up, George. Thank you. I'm Boeing and on the airlines as well. Do you know what bugs me? Status at airlines. Okay, so bear with me. I don't think you should be able to acquire status through spending money on credit cards. You can acquire points. I don't think you should this be able to acquire issue. status. I think you should be able to acquire status What's primarily. Status? What do you mean status? So you should be certain yeah. tiers so you can get access diamond, to lounges. Platinum. Oh, yeah, access right. to lounges. Yeah, yeah. You get priority for boarding. Right. Status that should America. be acquired through flying. Right. BA does this. There's two separate things. You get tier points, you get Avios. You can acquire Avios through spending on credit cards if right. you want to, flying as well. Right. Tier points is for flying and flying exclusively. And I'm and guessing, that goes to status. Right, which is the reason why the threshold for people when they fly gets higher and higher for getting status. Precisely. Because right. all the people who are coming in through spending on their American Express cards or whatever else, or their Delta or their American right. Airlines, or whatever cards, a. get it in for free and then it's crowded and then you got to wait in line and people That's are exactly what I'm talking exactly about. There's so many people listening to this <laughs> right now that know exactly what I'm talking about. The lounges are packed. A yes. leading. They're packed. A leading. Can't get in. A leading Good aviation line. CEO voiced exactly what you said, John, and he told me this is his single biggest headache. Delta, we talked about Delta. Go to Delta at JFK. Haven't, but yeah, okay. There is a line right around the corner. I don't even use these lounges when I travel for work. I anymore. don't either. True, I don't true, even go true. into them anymore. It's and, ridiculous. And yeah. then there's like a tiering of the tiered, right? I mean, this is basically talk about a hierarchical society. American at JFK. By, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. that's essentially yeah, what you see. Not only no. you're first in business and economy, now you've got Comfort Plus, and then you, you have the people who get priority access to the lounges, right. and the others have to wait no, in line. Here's the reality. Reddo Keeper of the Air Max is going to me, why are you having dinner at Fortnum and Mason and Heathrow and in not a, in the BA five. lounge? And I said, it's equal distance between the Hermes store and the Burberry store, so I can kill three birds with one stone. And it's at the bottom Mrs. of the bottom And it's of the at the escalator. bottom there, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's really good. Yeah, it's like a British thing. At least it's a British thing. They have tea <laughs> oh or tea, whichever it is. Nice scrambled eggs Ted with Lasso doesn't with eat salt. there. Nice yeah. scrambled eggs it's with salmon. I'm with you. It's great. I love the color of Yeah, I'm with you too. It's great. That light green. That's nice. <laughs> Bloomberg surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrell's off on a victory lap trying to get to the nine o'clock <laughs> hour. Bramo, full disclosure, I have ignored PPI because it used to be a big deal and then it wasn't a big deal. And all of a sudden, PP's a new big deal. I think this is actually going to be really important, especially <coughs> given what we saw yesterday. Does it confirm what we saw yesterday? Does it confirm what yeah. we saw yesterday? And then on a more granular basis ahead of earnings, do we see PPI coming in more than CPI? And that really is uh, what remains to be seen. Let's go to Michael McKee in Victor, Idaho, with unnamed economists catching trout. <laughs> Michael McKee on PPI. What do you see, Mike? 
Well, we're waiting also for jobless claims, but with PPI, we're seeing a better than expected number like we did with CPI yesterday. Final demand month over month, uh, only up a tenth. It was forecast to be up two tenths. Uh, the X food and energy up a tenth, X food and energy and trade, which is kind of what we look at as the core number for PPI, up only a tenth as well. So on a year over year basis, Headline PPI is up 2.4%, getting close to that uh, Fed level, and uh, the core, 2.6%. So more good news there. There was some thought that we might see a negative print with PPI this time, but uh, not yet. Now, jobless claims come in lower than they have been, which is another surprise, 237,000 after uh, 240, uh, let me get that number, 249. Uh, the month before, the week before, so it was raised by only a thousand. So jobless claims continue to show the strength of the labor market. The number of people who are still getting benefits, continuing claims, one million seven hundred and twenty-nine thousand. Uh, that is only slightly up from one million seven hundred eighteen the week before. So we're not seeing layoffs uh, in any great uh, to to any great extent. And we're not seeing prices rising mm-hmm. to any great extent. And that raises the question of soft landing and how many more times the Fed does feel it needs to raise interest rates. Michael, take a second look at the data. We'll do the markets here as we can. A lift to the markets. The NASDAQ 100 is what I'm watching more than anything, up seven tenths of percent on the tech roulette wheel, 15,552. SPX now up a sprightly 16 points. And critically, the VIX. Will we make a dash for 12? The VIX 13. Point four four, or all the way from a 15 level, what, 48 hours ago. Two-year yield comes in nine basis points, 4.66 uh, percent. I really want to make note of the real yield, 1.56 percent. Brent crude still above 80. That uh, gives some sprightliness. And the number one thing I would look at is the DXY index. To see DXY break through 100 I think would be extraordinary. Mike McKee, one more observation here very quickly. We've got a dash to Torsten Slock. What else do you see, Michael? Well, the only real news in the PPI is that it was all in services, a two-tenths rise uh, for services. There was no change in goods prices. We had seen uh, the goods versus services turn around a couple of months ago, and goods prices start rising faster, but now they've flattened out again. So it looks like the trajectory is good, and I know you'll talk about this with Torsten, but of course, PPI, not as important, doesn't have a direct relationship with CPI, but overall, the inflation news is good right now. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Reporting from Victor Idaho. We bust his chops about it, but this is a wonderful economic conference, precursor to Jackson Hole that has some huge value, great attendance as well, just beginning to think about the theories of the moment and the theories uh, forward. That has been the expertise of Torsten Slock, holding court at Deutsche Bank for years. He's chief economist at a rising uh, Apollo. Torsten, thank you so much for joining this morning. What's the operative theory right now for a Fed? Let's say they're restrictive. Some would say they're super restrictive. Underlying that is a need to turn at some point. What's the theory they have right now to get ready to turn out? quarters out, meetings out? Well, that's a really good question. And I think the answer to that is it's all about the dual mandate. That for a long, long time, they've been focusing on the inflation part of the dual mandate because it was very clear that inflation was and still is at levels that are too high for their comfort. I do think that the narrative, both for the Fed and also for markets, will now begin to change towards growth or towards employment. In other words, what are the reasons why we're still having this strong economy and if the lagged effects of monetary policy that they have spoken about for so long where it takes 12 to 18 months to slow the economy down well the lagged effects of fed hikes will eventually begin to slow things down we're already seeing that across all indicators and we should expect that also to happen over the coming quarters then how do you explain jobless claims coming in lower than expected how do you explain other metrics of wage growth continuing to remain robust Yeah, so in that sense, there's still a very strong labor market. Average hourly earnings last Friday went up, and this labor market, obviously, in jobless claims, still looking relatively tight, which certainly also get the Fed to say, well, we still need to hike rates more, and still tighter monetary policy is needed.
But at this point, if you see companies, whether it's Delta, whether it's Pepsi, whether it's a number of the others that are seeing profit margins expand with their input prices coming down more than what they can charge consumers, you have people who are employed. At what point does it become a virtuous cycle that offsets any pain of those rate hikes? Well, and also at this point, uh, as you also talk a lot about, the housing market is beginning to recover. Traffic of prospective buyers is going up. You look, existing home sales is going up. New home sales is going up. Home builder confidence, home buyer confidence, <coughs> even the number of offers received per sold property is also going up. Their bidding wars are coming back. And remember, housing makes up 40% of the CPI. So the risk is if we start <coughs> with core CPI, which was at 4.8, that's still just way too high for their comfort. So that's why for them, it's still the hawkish communication saying both on the inflation side and on the growth side, on the employment side of the dual mandate, we just got to keep making sure that we don't have an economy that continues to look overheated on a number of different fronts. I want to look at the larger optimist standpoint that America's fully employed. This was in the Zeitgeist off the jobs report uh, five, six, eight days ago. And this is the employment as compared to population ratio of prime age people in America. It is a full recovery mode, in particular, literally women. back on literally back on regression, back on trend. That's got to be the most optimistic chart for politicians in America. Well, and that's why the debate for the Fed is probably, well, do we need to soften the labor market? As you know, different FOMC members are putting different weight on this. <clears throat> do we need to soften the labor market to get inflation to come down? I mean, let's not forget inflation today, core CPI was at 48 we are nowhere near the 2% target where they want it to be. And with that backdrop, of course, they will continue to say, we just got to keep going because we still have way too high inflation. One less understood aspect of Fed policy is not just what happens when you raise rates at the pace they have, but what happens when you hold them for a prolonged period of time, especially as companies have already refinanced and aren't really capturing a lot of the higher yields that are being charged out there by investors? When does that bite? When does that scenario change? Yeah, no, the very important answer to that is that this is exactly the crystallization of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Where is it showing up? And the answer to your question, Lisa, it's showing up in a number of different places. You are beginning to see delinquency rates for auto loans going up, delinquency rates for credit cards are going up. You're beginning to see default rates for corporates on high yield going up, loans also see default rates going up. So across the board, both for consumers and for corporates, the conclusion is a default cycle has started. So it is biting. It's just not showing up at the macro level quite yet, but it's very clear that the effects right. of monetary policy are showing up in the background and it will eventually begin to slow things down. Lisa, this employment to population prime age, this is the core of America. The success of a decade, 2010, off of the terrible financial crisis, moving from 75 percent employed up to 80 percent employed. Granted, there's a lot of people not in that number that aren't employed. A pandemic that was worse than the financial crisis. We've rebounded back and we have burst through where we were in the autumn of 2019. It's a fully employed America of the people that are employable. Well, and this becomes sort of the question, what could change that scenario, which is why we're wondering about transmission mechanism. If you don't see that, you're saying we do see a default cycle that is starting. However, at the same time, some of these companies were sort of destined to default a while back and are now just sort of being washed out. What do you see this cycle looking like eventually? When do you start to see some of those lag effects taking effect? Well, one way to do that is on my Bloomberg screen to type SHOK and try to give a shock to the Fed funds rate, five percentage points higher. What is the profile for GDP over the next several years if you do raise the Fed funds rate by five percentage points in a very short period of time? And the answer is <clears throat> that it takes three, four, five quarters right. before you get the <clears throat> maximum impact. So in other ways, let's talk about this as what happened to the lack effects of monetary policy. Inflation is coming down, but what about growth? And I think the narrative will now shift away from saying inflation looks better, the trend is better, we're still at a high level. But what about this idea that when we step on the brakes, you will see monetary policy having a negative impact on consumption, on CapEx spending, and that's exactly what we're seeing. You see same store <coughs> retail sales is coming down, you're seeing CapEx spending coming down, default rates are going up, the language rates are going up. It is beginning to bite, as you're saying, Lisa, in the background. So we will and should still expect to see over the next several quarters a continued slowdown. This is what the Fed wants. This is the whole reason why they're raising interest rates to get the economy to continue to slow down. That's worked out well. Um, you know, I got 14 ways to go here in our two-hour conversation. 
But I, I've got to drive towards the arch overlay here, which you think about at Apollo, and I'm going to go to Paul Romer, the great growth economist, the great economist thinking about technology. Are we just fooling ourselves in that there's a technolo technological overlay where the halves of all incomes are benefiting from technology, and there's a whole other Luddite part of society that's not participating? Well, at least on the AI front, it's certainly something that's more happening in financial markets than out there in the real economy. What about out in the real economy? I'm thinking about your Germany flat on its back right now. No. Uh, well, the bottom line <clears throat> is still that the Europeans are definitely, of course, experiencing some headwinds as a result of the AI boom that we're seeing in the U.S. at the moment. Unfortunately, we're not quite seeing that in the productivity data as we speak, but you're right over time. This will certainly be something that helps. I don't think this matters so much for the business cycle in the near term and for the Fed, but I do think that it does matter for discussions about the potential growth rate of the U.S. economy. Just quickly here, you were talking about how as inflation comes down, that's when you start <clears throat> to see profits, come, revenues come down. Is this sort of the unspoken reality that actually inflation was positive for companies, increased their revenues, and allowed the growth? Oh, absolutely. This is spot on because inflation is not only about output prices, it's also input prices. In other words, things that are sold when you have high inflation could have wider profit margins. <clears throat> but the cost of production were also right. very elevated. And if all that comes down, it's not only helping in terms of lower cost of production, it's also going to squeeze margins. What we're going to do here, folks, is we're going to do a data check because we do have markets on the move after what we saw with Lisa Bramowitz's PPI uh, a, a data. We're going to keep Torsten Slack with us this conversation so timely right now with futures uh, legging it out. Uh, futures nicely up 15. NASDAQ futures up 7 tenths of a percent have a life of their own. I'll let Lisa explain that. Yields come in constructively. And again, as Stephen Englander uh, said from Standard Charter Bank, uh, there seems to be a game-changing tone to the market. Brent crude 80. And I'm really watching DXY. For DXY to break under 100 would be a huge, de a huge deal today of a weaker dollar. The percent move on the Standard & Poor's up three-tenths of a percent. I keep thinking, Tom, about what Torsten Slock just said, and we heard a similar kind of discussion from Tony Dwyer, that when revenues come in, that is when it is a game changer. And perhaps one of the most unstated, understated, <clears throat> and also misunderstood aspects of inflation was how much it boosted companies' revenues, how much yes, it boosted yes, a lot of Phil the growth. Curry, and all of a sudden, when you start to nope. see inflation come in <clears throat> and revenues don't increase at the same kind of right. levels, then how much do you see a resetting back to a normal type of economic This is where backdrop. you impute the inflation in the system. The giant Phil Carre, value investor, pioneer in New York, lived to be 104, uh, whatever. Nominal GDP is the great misguess right now, isn't it? Absolutely. And what's really critical about this is that equities trade on nominal data, bonds and rates trades on real data. Stop the show. Guys, frame that. Give that to every show this week. Say it again. Nominal GDP matters. Because what matters for nominal earnings in the S&P 500, which has grown 6% annually for the last 40 years, is all about nominal variables and nominal GDP, nominal revenue. Everything is measured in nominal terms. So when inflation comes down, you should also expect the bond market to look at that and say, well, that's not for us. That's what's happening in equities. Whereas bond markets will say it's all about what's happened on the real side, meaning on the volume on the unit side. Torsten, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate this today with Apollo as well. This nominal, people go to me, why are you talking like that? Why does Michael Darda talk like that? Why does Torsten Slack? It's a nominal world out there in the CEO corporate world. We used to think that inflation would be bad for <clears throat> stocks because bond right. yields went up. It turns out, maybe not. I just had a nightmare. Do you think Torsten Slack's ever had a cheese it Frito-Lay, <laughs> up 14% revenue. There's your nominal world. Good morning, it's Bloomberg. We have great news today that inflation has been cut by two thirds. So my message is take yes for an answer, Chair Powell, and let's stop with the rate increases. Done. The economist, Elizabeth Warren, as I said earlier, hugely capable, whatever your politics and bankruptcy law, which maybe is a monetary theory. But uh, you think she's looking at it to John, the tension between me and John and the victory lap of the Fed and all that. And Warren's going, would you guys just look at the facts, please?
Which I love it. Just done. <clears throat> Guys, yes. The answer is yes. Is that what she said? Move on. Uh, move on. And uh, that seems to be her theme. Of course, if this does continue or the jobless claims show strength and we see disinflation for now, when does that create more <clears throat> of a concern about sticky inflation? I say to the Fed, I'm going to give them some major slack here. They're by definition ex post. They're always late as they were on transitory. We've got a very interesting Fed schedule, July 26, September 20, November 1, December 13th. And we're in like four places for this. I think we're coming to you on the schedule from London at some point. I think we're coming. John has, I think, November 1 or from some island near Capri. We're doing the Fed Decides from some island near Capri. I, I don't know. It's going to be eventful, but the Fed meetings will be extraordinary. Watching that will be Ira Jersey, chief U.S. Interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, what bond data did you watch yesterday when we saw a game-changing report? What was the thing that, that moved or the elasticity of movement where you said, oh, wow, that signals it? Well, g given that we had the CPI data and that affects the tips market, we were looking very closely at what happened to the Treasury inflation protected market. Uh, the two components of it. So firstly, uh, what did the inflation expectations do, which actually didn't do very much at all, uh, which surprised us a little bit, uh, but importantly, uh, real yield. So the, the yield on the actual tips instruments came down a lot, and they, they're current continually uh, continuing that rally this morning. Um, and in part, that I think that that's a, uh, an acknowledgement that the Federal Reserve's not going to go the 50 basis points that uh, the dots said, and certainly uh, not as far um, as the uh, as the market had feared earlier in the week. I'm going to steal the thunder. Five-year real yield here, really something, folks, coming right back to uh, middle June levels, as I put it. Ira, I'm going to steal from uh, Bramo here and go, what does this do to the corporate spread market? Because the big theme here is is Ben, frankly, corporate spreads out front have indicated more optimism. They've been very narrow. What does other debt do off of your full faith and credit world? Well, so I think, you know, investment grade corporate spreads, I think it's going to become much more idiosyncratic in, in a lot of the, uh, the spread <clears throat> markets, in particular because uh, when you have this contraction of, um, you know, CPI coming down, but also producer prices that came in this morning not quite as high as, as the market was expecting, you could have a bit of a contraction in margins at, at, uh, for, for some firms. But that being said, um, corporate balance sheets are much cleaner than they have been in, in you know, over uh, over time. So you're not you're not going into this crisis and you're not going into this slowdown that we're seeing in the economy the same way you did in say 2007 or even 2001 when you had significantly more leverage. Uh, in, in balance sheets, particularly for better rated companies. We were just talking, Ira, with uh, Torsten Slock of Apollo about the lag effects of monetary policy. He was saying we do expect to see weakness down the line eventually from the Fed raising rates as much as they did. A viewer wrote in and said, why do we think that monetary policy works at all if uh, the Fed was holding <laughs> rates at zero for more than a decade, thinking it would juice inflation, and it didn't? Is there a possibility that the transmission mechanism is simply broken? Well, I don't think it's broken. I just think it's changed and that the, the lag is much longer now. So when you go back to the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, you had much more short-term debt held by both the household sector and businesses. You had a lot more commercial paper. You had a, a, even the banking sector. You, you had a lot of pass-through from monetary policy because they funded with repurchase agreements and commercial paper, so very short-term debt <coughs> instruments. Today, that's been termed out quite significantly. So, so I do think that there's going there, there's an impact that monetary policy will have. It's just that it's going to take much longer because now you have to wait for the housing market to slow. You have to wait for um, the, you know the interest rates being higher to feed through the economy a lot more because you know in order for corporate corporate weighted average cost of capital to go up, you have to wait for a lot more debt to mature. And those maturities are not as, uh, it, there's no wall of maturities that's going to suddenly be refinanced and increase those costs of capital. So, so I do think monetary policy has similar effects. It's just that the lags 
are longer maybe than, than what we've been used to in the, the post-war period so here's, far. Here's the problem, though. The market is a forward-looking instrument, and you're seeing bond yields already coming down on the long end, much more than on the front end, because people are expecting we will normalize and that monetary policy will work. And yet that offsets the tightening that you could potentially <laughs> see in longer-term debt. I mean, it's just mind-spinning how this is all working. So if anything, we're seeing an easing in financial conditions that will actually allow companies to more easily refinance, et cetera. So but, but again, Lisa, I ask Lisa, you know, But that's yeah. not new. That's not, that's not new. The same thing happened in 1981. The same thing happened in the early 90s. The same, th same thing happened in the, in the aughts when, you know, Alan Greenspan talked about the conundrum, right? And so this is just a, a natural reaction to higher front end yields means that the market's going to, as you said, <clears throat> be forward looking and say, you know, hey, what is the Fed going to do? Where are interest rates going to be three, five years from now? So one of the scenarios that the market could realistically be pricing right now is for the Fed to do nothing for the next three years and then cut interest rates to 2% and keep <clears throat> them there. So if that's if that's the a possible outcome, then the the ten year yield right now is at fair value based on that series of outcomes five percent five percent interest rates right. in the front end for uh, until twenty twenty seven and then suddenly they go down to two percent and stay there. Many talk and opine like people in bow ties who really don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> and others do. We're going to stop the show right now and go to the single person I know who knows more about American soccer than anyone on the planet. Ira Jersey does this. He's been committed to it for years with youth soccer in New Jersey and on. Ira, let me begin with Mr. Messi and the MLS. Can the rest of the players of the ML MLS keep up with the greatest player in the world? Well, maybe not at home. You know, one of the things that when... Uh, players come over from Europe to the United States is they don't appreciate how much travel there is in the U.S. and how just how vast our country is. So, um, so, so it's not the same as taking a train or a bus on a couple hour trip in, in England or Spain and, and a lot of the European countries where these right. players come from. So I think that's the great equalizer. Um, you know, obviously, Lionel Messi is the GOAT, right? He's the greatest of all time, almost in, in, in there's almost undisputed. Um, so, you know, him coming to, to Major League Soccer, I think, is good for the game here and the sport because it brings a lot of attention to, to the game right. and will help uh, grow the sport in general. Bramos right now to World Cup 26 tickets this weekend. One plus one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 72, 104 matches. Steal us here. Is this going to be like 70, 80,000 people in a stadium with all, you know, around the country? Is this going to be a big a deal as is, is, is European soccer people would suggest? I, I would doubt that. I, I think that almost every game will probably be near sold out, if not sold out. You know, maybe not a, a few games. It is, an, it, it, it is a larger World Cup, so it's the first time they're going to a 48-team World Cup. So there are some smaller countries that maybe won't have the international appeal as, as some of the others. But it's hard to imagine, you know, the, the big games and, and the, the knockout rounds um, not having sold out crowds. You know, the, the, uh, a lot of the stadiums that they're playing in, things like, you know, Lincoln Financial here in Philadelphia or MetLife Stadium, uh, it's, they're going to be sold out. I remember going yeah. to Copa America in 2016 with my son watching, watching Lionel Messi play in, with Argentina against Chile, and that was a sold out stadium too. And that was, you know, that was just a Copa America. That wasn't including, right. you know, this wasn't a World Cup. So this is even a bigger stage. So it's hard yeah. to imagine you don't have great attendance at these matches. Ira Jersey, you are the best. He is the coach that everybody talks about in the madness of American kids' sports. Ira Jersey, excellent on interest rate strategy. He's the one, and, and I, I, I coached Little League once long ago and you far did. away. Yeah, with parents telling you what to do. Why isn't my kid playing shortstop? <laughs> and, and, and there's so much trauma now in American kids' sports that people like Ira Jersey are just going, do I need to do this? And Ira is just totally committed to it. Were you one of those dads who basically said, if you don't get three no. home runs, don't come home? No. You know what I was? I was the one where the moms came up and said, would you please be the assistant coach? Because the head coach thinks he's in the NHL. I mean, really, they would literally come up and beg me because I'd be out there laughing, making jokes with them. <laughs> it's, uh, the guys like it's Ira true. Jersey are treasured. I mean, this is something really special. These guys that are out there every week doing Stadiums kids sports. or stadia.
I, I don't know. If you go to Chicago, it's probably Stadia. What do I know? Futures up 16. The VIX 13.4. This is important. Stay with the markets here for the next 35 minutes. It's going to be quite an opening. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Good morning. 